Good morning, everyone. Our, uh, our keynoter is in the building, so I can begin uh, with a very brief uh, introduction and welcome. Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson, Executive Vice President of the Aspen Institute, and I'm uh, really delighted to welcome you all today because I think what this whole project represents is such a, uh, a, a good illustration of what the Aspen Institute uh, uh, does best and we think does in a, in a singular way which is bringing policy experts, uh, industry leaders, uh, government officials, and uh, uh, representatives of the media uh, together to grapple with problems of national importance, identify their root causes, and then work together to make recommendations that often transcend uh, partisan uh, perspectives. Uh, using this approach, this, the Institute has crafted novel and important and often uh, uh, path-breaking uh, solutions to problems across a broad spectrum of domestic policy, foreign policy, uh, especially recently in, in national security, in environmental sustainability, uh, in uh, 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 programs relating to poverty, uh, and most recently uh, in, in health care. Uh, and where, with the help of uh, leading physicians, uh, health policy experts, health plan leaders, uh, we have worked to improve the quality uh, of health care uh, and improve access uh, as well. Our, our work in health care reform began in uh, earnest in, in 2007. Uh, the Aspen Institute has been working uh, across partisan lines across all areas uh, since 1950. Uh, but for some remarkable reason, largely because we've grown more opportunistically than strategically, we didn't have a health policy program. Uh, I, I started one in, in, in 2007, and uh, uh, we're very proud of, of what it has uh, accomplished. Uh, that, of course, was during the run-in to the last presidential, to, to that presidential election. Uh, it was a pivotal time as candidates were all putting forth proposals uh, to deal with improving uh, the American health care system. But many of those proposals, of course, uh, focused uh, in large part on symptoms, very important symptoms, and it was much more difficult to, to grapple with some of the fundamental causes of the problems uh, that led to uh, the uh, widespread demand for some changes. So to complement the debate, we launched the Health Stewardship Project uh, to look beyond new financing mechanisms and to focus more on patients and promoting high-value care. And we're actually very proud of the fact that many of our recommendations were included in the Affordable Care Act, specific, specifically in provisions that will increase uh, access to primary care and preventive services uh, through programs that will help to establish the comparative effectiveness of treatments for a wide variety of common conditions. Of course, we didn't stop there because there is so much more to be done. Uh, and with the support especially of WellPoint, uh, the Health Innovation Project uh, was launched, a new initiative within a larger stewardship uh, project uh, that seeks to identify and, provoke and promote innovative models of care. Uh, the authors of the Health Innovation Project's first report, Reinventing Healthcare, the Barriers to Innovation, made a series of recommendations uh, for fostering innovation and then really went on a road trip traveling around the country to learn from those on the frontiers uh, who are succeeding at innovation despite all the barriers uh, that exist. Uh, today you're going to be hearing from those innovators uh, directly as well as from the authors of the report who are here to discuss ways of spreading uh, these models of care uh, as broadly as possible. Uh, so I'm now going to turn things over to uh, the uh, person who has been very ably directing our health program since the person we brought in uh, was, uh, uh, was hired by the FDA. Uh, Fran Marie Kennedy has done a terrific job. I should mention that we, we will be bringing in uh, a, a new head of our health program who's going to be working closely with Fran Marie uh, in November. Uh, some of you may already know her, Ruth Katz. Uh, who's been a leader in health care at, at uh, two leading institutions, two, two uh, public health schools, medical schools, and also now plays a, a leading role in health care policy on the Hill. Uh, I also want to mention, uh, and you're among the first to hear this, that we are going to bring back uh, what we had very successfully presented in Aspen uh, two times several years ago, 
uh, which was the Aspen Health Forum, modeled on the Aspen Ideas Festival, uh, with a very detailed uh, look at across a broad spectrum of healthcare policy issues uh, about innovations at the cutting edge of medical and biological science uh, and also global health. And we will actually be kicking off the Aspen Ideas Festival next year, actually preceding it with a, a, a focus on healthcare. We'll probably be calling it Aspen Ideas Health. Uh, you'll be hearing much more about that. And I think uh, with Ruth's arrival and with a, a new uh, commitment to health uh, policy uh, and medical science here at the Institute, I think you'll be seeing more and more uh, that we're doing. So uh, with no further ado, uh, let me bring up uh, Fran Marie. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. That was just lovely. Um, as he was saying, um, I want to start my remarks, as we always do, welcoming everyone and thanking WellPoint for making this journey possible. We have been working with WellPoint for a number of years on this project, as you've heard. And um, I also want to talk about uh, our strategic partnerships, uh, one of them with uh, the Center for Medicare Medicaid uh, Services, CMS, to many of you. Um, it started several years ago with this project, uh, and then Andy Shin was our contact at the Innovation Center, and he has continued, even though he, his tenure at CMS has uh, actually given him an opportunity to work on the same subjects on the, in the private sector, he's still with us on this project. And thank you, Andy. Thank you, CMS. Uh, we're now working with Dr. Patrick Conway, who will magically appear because he is <laughs> parking <laughs> his car. Um, he is our keynote speaker, and he has been instrumental in also partnering on this project and the next iteration of the project, which will be hosting the second uh, Care Innovation Summit, which will be announced uh, within the next month. It will be in 2014 here in Washington. And it will be um, extraordinary because uh, Andy's involved in, in, the, uh, in the effects and the, um, the content, as is uh, CMS. So uh, stay tuned. You, having shown up today, you will be invited to it. So uh, let me, I think um, Elliot did a great uh, job of telling you the history. It started in 2007 when we put together a group of advisors to say what is it that Aspen can do of most significance in the health reform area. And they agreed that the 10 principles on which all sustainable health reform can be based is the most important thing that we did. Uh, that publication is available in a, in a little card outside, but downloadable uh, on our website. Uh, so it was a, a great um, excitement that we worked with the administration and did get some of our principles incorporated into the ACA. And since 2010, we decided, okay, in 2011, we need to, the work is still, um, there's a lot to be done. We worked with uh, WellPoint as well, CMS, on again, putting together an advisory group to advise us on what can we do of most significance. And that is the innovation project. Uh, we're in our second iteration. Uh, we have our authors here to talk about their, uh, I think, inspirational um, white paper that is, was designed to be a conversation starter uh, that would engage people outside the Beltway. Uh, and we certainly have gone around the country uh, involving CMS's um, grantees. Uh, and we've had a, just an extraordinary learning experience where uh, our authors were able to discuss with what we call the innovation in action. <laughs> yes, he's here. <laughs> okay, I can stop now. <laughs> um, and you're going to hear from a number of them here. They're shining lights of innovation. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Liz Hall, who's the vice president for WellPoint. She will give uh, short remarks, and I will whisk Patrick in, and then she will introduce him. Liz. Thank you, Fran Marie, and thank you, Elliot. We are so pleased to be part of today, as well as, and more importantly, to be part of this project. Uh, as Fran Marie said, we've been working for a long time to look not only at the barriers, but really to help identify those innovators who are helping us find solutions and having success at overcoming those barriers. And if there is nothing else that we do, 
that is one of the most important things that we at WellPoint uh, see for the future that we really have to move forward on. Um, I do want to thank the Aspen Institute. This has been a fantastic partnership, uh, really going out and about around the country to, to find those innovators. I want to thank the authors who took their time out uh, to help us write up the most uh, uh, promising of those projects. Um, and I also want to thank the innovators themselves for spending time with us to talk about the programs, talk about the successes, talk about the challenges that they encountered and how they overcame them, particularly those who are here with us today. I think that, that you all will find what they have to share inspiring. Um, and quite frankly, we want to issue a challenge to others out there uh, to continue to push further, farther, and faster. At WellPoint, we really do hope, as we are, are trying to ensure currently 36 million Americans, but expanding that every day, as we all know, with the, the advent of the Affordable Care Act coverage that starts very, very soon, that it's really, really important to bring some of these innovations, and as appropriate, we want to bring some of these innovation, in, innovative programs further across the country. If they're scalable, we want to scale them. If they're replicable, we would like to really work with you all to replicate them. So on behalf of WellPoint, I just want to again thank the Aspen Institute. We, we really have done a great job of seeking out pockets of healthcare innovation across the country, identifying the men and women who are working to overcome the challenges and promoting their efforts to, to really a broader audience. Um, and as I said, want to issue that challenge to innovators across the country, entrepreneurs, we really can go further faster. Um, we in Washington like to put out white papers, and, and I think that a lot of us see a lot of these at their desk all the time and put them all in a nice little pile. I will say that of all of the white papers that are written, this one and the other pieces that have been developed as part of this project are worth taking a look at, are worth reading. Um, they really are inspiring and, and an awesome source of information. Um, with that, with no further ado, I do um, have the pleasure and honor of, of introducing um, Dr. Patrick Conway. Uh, Patrick may not remember this, but uh, I got to know Patrick when he was a, a White House fellow. Um, he had this just minor assignment uh, that he took on uh, as, if, as if it would be no problem uh, to help CMS make its claims data more accessible and usable to, to both researchers and entrepreneurs and innovators. Uh, that project isn't over, it continues, but und undauntedly, he has taken on even more at the department. Um, it is, has been amazing to see him rise through the ranks and really make a difference. Uh, he is now the chief medical officer, as many of you know. Um, he's also the director for the Center of Clinical Standards and Quality and the acting director of the Center for Medicaid, uh, Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Um, he approaches everything with enthusiasm and zeal, and I don't think that, uh, that we could have gotten a better speaker to kick off today's event to hopefully in, inspire and, and really push us all further faster. Thank you all. Thanks so much uh, for the kind introduction. Great to be here. Sorry about only getting here three minutes before talking. Um, I will. I was looking last night at my slides, and I, I, I pared down what my assistant gave me. I think I still have too many. So I'm going to fly through the slides. I'll share them. And then I really want to make sure um, we have some time for uh, discussion questions. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some early results, value-based purchasing, about the Innovation Center, uh, quality measurement to drive improvement, and, and future opportunities for collaboration. You all know this, so I won't go through this. You know, largest purchaser of healthcare in the world by far, insuring over 100 million Americans um, and growing with the marketplaces. Um, this slide uh, originally came from Rick Gilfillan, uh, and we've sort of uh, continued to modify it over time. But if you think about the current state and sort of the ideal future state, uh, moving towards people centered outcomes-driven, sustainable, coordinated care systems. And then at the bottom of the slide, we call out certainly not all, but some of our payment interventions uh, trying to drive towards this future state and be a catalyst. So value-based purchasing, ACOs, shared savings, episode-based payments and, and bundling, care management, conference of primary care, data transparency. I do, rem I do remember that. And it went from like a small room to now it's like a data palooza that I barely understand. So, but it's very exciting uh, to see all the app development and other work going on. Um, and I should say, because I won't talk about this again today unless people want to, I think this data piece is critically important. So how do we leverage data as a strategic resource? How do we get data out there so app developers and others can drive care? Um, this slide I'm going to 
fly through. T2, uh, outcomes research, what works is a JAMA paper we wrote in 2008. T3, how do you reliably redesign care systems? So by way of background, I've come in and out of government a couple times. Uh, most recently was at Cincinnati Children's, and my primary role really was around uh, care redesign. So how did you redesign care across our complex system? Uh, how did you reliably create change? For example, we got where we could shift a process that we were uh, at one or two percent, make it high reliability, 99 to 100 percent within 60 days. So shift our whole system. So how do you do that across health systems? I'll, I'll skip through this as well, but Carolyn Clancy and I wrote this paper about sort of um, uh, transformational at the front line, so quality measurement, compared effectiveness, sort of quality improvement collaboratives and learning networks. I do think this sort of continuous learning healthcare system, which a lot of people have written about, you know, how do you really execute that to truly have learning collaboratives that are driving change? Um, I'm going to briefly talk about some early example results. I had to testify um, uh, on the Hill yesterday about some of this work. Um, so cost, as you know, uh, we're at historic lows. I actually put another data point out now with the new national health expenditures that came out. And our own actuaries, which are relatively conservative now, say, um, you know, it's, there, is, there were economic issues, but now we truly have some fundamental shifts uh, in the delivery system in terms of costs. Um, there's still a lot of variation. Everyone knows this. This, uh, this control chart I actually have on my wall in all three of my offices now because <laughs> they make me travel around a lot. Um, uh, so uh, this is a control chart on Medicare uh, all-cause readmissions. I actually should reset the baseline now for the QI people in the audience. You know, we were rock solid at 19, 19 and a half, you know, about one in, 20, one in five Medicare beneficiaries being readmit, readmitted in this country. Uh, started payment incentives. Um, and I think importantly, invested in quality improvement via QIOs, partnership for patients, community-based organizations in 2012. And you can see really right around the beginning of 2012 into 2011, you can really see dramatic uh, decrease after that. We are now consistently below 18%, heading towards 17%. Um, more than 100,000 Medicare beneficiaries staying home and healthy. I think an example where you align payment incentives uh, with uh, technical infrastructure investment and innovation, you can generate dramatic results. I was testifying on bloodstream infections. You know, we're down 44% in bloodstream infections in this country. We're down 22% for surgical site infections. I mean, you're moving national needles, and the way we're doing it, I would argue, is innovation, aligned incentives, um, and really investing in that. Also, best practice learning. So line infections, I can tell you we've done a lot of sort of spreading from one hospital system to the next. Early elective deliveries, I'm a pediatrician. Uh, we're down 48% uh, for early elective deliveries uh, in many of the systems, um, uh, less than 39 weeks. So preventing NICU stays and, and preterm birth. I know I'm flying through this, but I want to make sure I learn more by having discussion. It's, it's actually boring for me to hear myself talk, but to listen to you is, is good. Um, Value-based purchasing, we have the national quality strategy. We align with the six goals, you know, safety, person and, and family uh, engagement, communication, coordination, prevention and treatment of disease, working with communities to help uh, promote healthy living, making care affordable. These are our quality measures programs. We use the national quality strategy to align our quality measures into those six domains. We've done a lot of work over the last couple of years, and now we've met the goal where, you know, people, uh, hospitals and physicians, for example, can, and other clinicians can report once on one set of measures and meet uh, criteria for all quality programs for the federal government. So this is a very different place than we were two years ago. And really then enables, if you pick the right outcome measures and you enable that type of aligned reporting, then we'll uh, really generate uh, faster results. This, um, I think we have some innovation work to do here, but this is the vertical alignment from sort of community to a practice and a group of patients to the individual clinician and patient. So how do you align measurement vertically as well? Um, I want to get to the Innovation Center stuff. So we wrote this paper. You can read it if you want. It had five uh, outcomes. It was in New England Journal around value-based purchasing. Uh, the first one maybe is the most important. So define the end goal, not uh, the process for achieving it, which enables innovation. Um, I'm going to shift to the Innovation Center. Um, so I have some slides here, but actually I had a phone call with John Blum this morning. Uh, so I'll go a little off script. I think basically we have to do three things right now. Um, there's probably more, but um, one, we have to execute the current models well 
and we have to identify in rapid cycle which can be scaled. So there's a statutory criteria around, by the way, there's three things. Quality goes up and cost is the same. Costs go down and quality is at least the same or better. In best case scenario, quality goes up and cost goes down. I say there's three things, sometimes we forget. Technically, a model like Partnership for Patients, if quality went up and costs are at least the same, that would meet the statutory criteria for scaling. Um, so one, we need to execute on the current models, figure out what's, what, uh, what is scalable. Um, two, we need to round out the portfolio. So this is a, I worked at McKinsey at one point in my life. I've actually been talking to some VC and private equity people, all that make way more money than I do, but started with me at McKinsey. Um, and, you know, I've been thinking a lot about sort of, um, you're at this sort of midpoint of a portfolio almost. How do you assess what you've done so far and then strategically think about the gaps and how you fill those gaps? And you honestly, you need to do that over the next 12 to 18 months because it takes time, probably 12 months, it takes time for these models to get set up. Then there's a long evaluation stream. So at that point, you're heading close to 2019. The other thing about the Innovation Center that a lot of people don't know, it automatically renews in law another $10 billion in 2019. So the only thing we have to do is not screw up the first $10 billion, um, and it will automatically renew. Um, I ought, I'm going a little, I am going off script, but I, this, some of these concepts, I work for Secretary Levitt. A lot of these concepts, these are not Democratic or Republican concepts. It's, you know, you got a $900 billion plus health system it probably makes sense to invest uh, $10 billion a year in the innovation and delivery system transformation and testing new models. So, uh, but we need to make that case to the American people and to Congress and to others and show that the investment is actually delivering returns. Therefore, the investment makes sense going forward. Sorry, that was totally off script. This is actually the Affordable Care Act language. These are our models. So we are currently um, saying, you know, this is our portfolio of models, exactly what I just described at a high level, but then getting into the details. Okay, what other models would we need to launch? What would those look like? What's the time frame? What's the staffing? There's also, sorry, I didn't do the three, third thing. The third is sort of innovation has to be broader than just CMS and every, I mean, than just the innovation center. So we got to integrate with the rest of CMS, got to integrate with the rest of federal government, and then we got to leverage the private sector. So how do you really partner with the private sector? So there's this sort of integration and partnership theme, which is almost like a foundational element. This is some, I mean, this is amazing, right? This is uh, not even all the dots, but these are various innovation center engaged entities across the country. So uh, really a wide swath, amazing uh, testing of models. Um, this talks about accountable care organizations, um, uh, one of the models that we're testing with Pioneers. Um, this shows you've got the Medicare Shared Savings Program and now Pioneers, over 250 ACOs, over 4 million Medicare beneficiaries. That's almost 10% of the Medicare uh, population just in ACOs. Um, actually, I'll test out another concept with you, also from this morning. Um, uh, you know, if you think about Medicare or Medicaid or sort of the nation in general, you could put populations in four buckets of payment. So this will be, this is real-time feedback. You can tell me what you think about this. Um, one would be, you know, totally traditional fee-for-service, so no payment linked to quality or value. Bucket number two would be uh, at least a portion of the payment is linked to quality and value. And actually in Medicare now with the Affordable Care Act, most of our settings have at least a portion, most of our settings and interactions, at least a portion is tied to quality and value. Three would be uh, alternative payment models uh, on top of a fee-for-service chassis, if you will. So uh, accountable care organizations, shared savings, bundling, really, you know, alternative payment models. And four is, you know, capitated plan payments. So I think we need to, I don't know that those are the exact four right categories, you can give me feedback, but I think we should proactively be thinking about those categories or whatever the right categories are, measuring which beneficiaries are in those categories, and start to have a discussion around, you know, what would we want the ideal state to look like in those four categories? And we're definitely shifting along that spectrum. I, I know, I know, we've, and I'm not, uh, I got feedback today, be careful on the MA portion. I'm not saying that it's a perfect alignment and everybody must move to MA. I'm not saying that in case there's a reporter in the room. Um, I'm just saying these are the four categories um, and we should think about, you know, what might be the ideal state and also realizing, you know, we have a theme around enabling beneficiary choice, which we believe in as a principle. Um, uh, but within that choice, how do you still incentivize quality and value? I don't know, hopefully that was helpful. Um, state innovation models, I put this, this is great work, and I think we need to, um, traditionally, um, 
like when I started three months ago, there were seven people in the Innovation Center leading this team. We're building this team out. This is, they're working with uh, 25 states, 19 designs, six implementation. We've announced publicly that we plan to have another announcement to bring in more states in early 2014. Um, and these states are, I've been meeting with them as they come in. Some of them are doing amazing innovation work on, you know, I'm going to redesign care in my state, my model. And people hear about Oregon and some of them, but I'd say, you know, Arkansas with bundles, if anybody hasn't heard about it. Really amazing work on sort of redesigning multi-payer efforts in Arkansas. We've got to help states do this work. So we're thinking about what's the data, the infrastructure, the tools, the people we do to partner with states. And states, as you all know, can do a lot of innovative things that we can't always do at the federal level. So just tremendous work we need to build on. We have healthcare innovation round two. These were the four categories. We got in about a thousand, or I think I'm not supposed to say that. We got in a significant number of applications. Um, uh, so lots of innovation. We'll be uh, evaluating those uh, and making awards. Um, this partnership for patients I talked about yesterday, um, uh, and actually I'll go beyond this slide. We had 20, we had the bold goal of 40% reduction in healthcare acquired conditions, 20% reduction in hacks. Um, I, I actually, um, I started working more directly with partnership for patients about six months ago, and then obviously in the last three months in the innovation center very directly. Um, six months ago, if I looked at the hospital engagement networks, they had to meet at least 30% reduction in hacks and at least six or more harms. I would have told you that I thought about half of them were going to make it. So, and this is for the sort of option year driving forward. They all hit the targets. So about six months ago, we had a come to, uh, you know, your option year is an option. Let's all work together. We got to hit these goals. And this is, you know, you can look over the last six months. This, the top is sort of reporting. The next is um, improving on five or more hacks. Um, and the bottom is benchmark performance, so what we thought was best in class performance. The last six months moving from, you know, very few improving to almost two-thirds, and this number keeps going up. Um, and, you know, about a third, sorry, I don't have my glasses on, about a third, you know, hitting benchmark performance. This is amazing results. I mean, this is driving change across the nation. So we'll be looking to talk more about this publicly with our communications folks. And I shared it on the Hill yesterday, so it's in the public sphere now. Um, I talked a little about this, you know, what we're focused on, implementation of models, monitoring and optimization of results, evaluation and scaling, integration and integrating innovation. And I, it says across CMS, I'd say broader than just CMS, you know, really thinking about that broader national sort of integration uh, portfolio, if you will, and then portfolio analysis and launch of new models to round out the portfolio. So this, um, uh, this is possible model concepts. I, of course, have to be careful here. I'm not telling you what the Innovation Center will launch next, but just to spur some discussion. Um, you know, outpatient specialty models, we've got a lot of feedback on sort of uh, whether it's oncology, cardiology, or even almost like functional models. So how would you think about episode-based payments, et cetera, uh, the outpatient specialty space. Practice transformations. So we've had a number of folks come in and say basically, you know, we're, we're with you. We, and these are, we want to transform, but we don't actually ha know how to move from my, especially, you know, I'm a practice of 30 GI docs in Cincinnati. I don't actually know how to move from fee-for-service to, like, an accountable care organization. So I'm going to need support first to figure out, like, how to report on quality and what this all means, then, like, what are some population health management tools and how would that work with my EHR and how am I going to do this work. And I think there's some interesting work one could fund here on, you know, entities that could support practices to really move along that spectrum uh, and achieve the results we want. And I think if we don't make that investment, it, it, I have to be a little, it could be a lost opportunity, but look for feedback. Um, health plan innovation. Um, we don't have anything in the health plan. We have very little in that we have some of in the innovation awards and some things, but we have very little in the health plan space. Some plans have come into us and said, you know, if you put out a general RFI that said, you know, allow us to innovate, for example, in the MA space or broadly, we would come in with uh, interesting ideas. Consumer incentives, ACOs version 2.0, we're getting a lot of feedback about what's that next level of, of accountable care organizations. Home health and skilled nursing facility right now, we don't have much in the way of models. Um, and there certainly could be more. Somebody's calling me, but I'll ignore that. Um, uh, so the res I talked a little about this. So early promising results. We talked about the cost. We talked about some of the partnership for patient results. Um, I should say, because it's not on here, like some of our core programs, which we probably don't talk about as much, hospital value-based purchasing, those measures, we put this report on our website 
200 pages on our website. Amazingly, everybody doesn't read that. I know that's surprising. Uh, I try to explain to our folks, you know, people aren't trolling our website for the 200 page reports. Um, uh, hospital value-based purchasing and those measures, 85% of them have pr improved significantly. And so much so that now we have to pull out a bunch of process measures that are topped out, replace them with new process measures or outcome-oriented measures. So, you know, I'd say these core programs, which we don't talk about as much, are driving innovation. They are driving hospitals to say, okay, how would I improve on these measures? We should always work on the measures. Are they the right measures? Are they the ones that matter, et cetera? But really are driving some results. And I will end with some time for discussion. Um, we wrote this paper about the future quality measurement. I'm not going to go into in details with Farzad um, and Carolyn, but really talked about you know patient-centered measures, outcomes of care, really measuring what matters, and the point being improvement. Um, I will briefly talk about this paper because this was like the hardest 1,200 words I wrote in a long time. Um, uh, so uh, the references there, I'll try to do this quickly. If, if you accept that the goal of a health system may be to optimize health outcomes um, and uh, and produce value, so health outcomes for a given cost over time. Um, and then you put in some data points, the average Medicare beneficiary at 65 enters Medicare, we insure for at least 15 years now. Um, Medicaid obviously has the chance to insure people for very long periods. You've got exchanges where you can imagine there's a little bit more churn back and forth within the exchange. Um, so you know, how would, we, how would we manage health trajectories given that framework over the lifespan as opposed to a shorter sort of period? Uh, and then we talked about a few things. We talked about horizontally integrated health, education, and social services that promote health in all policies, places, and daily activities. That's literally a sentence from the paper. There's a lot embedded in that sentence, and it's hard to execute on. But I think if our health system was designed that way, you would get much closer to a health outcomes over the life course. Um, consumer incentives like value-based insurance design, warranties, which are happening some now, bundled payments. Measuring health outcomes and rewarding plans for improvement over time. So some of this already occurs, but how would you sort of think about that population health management? Community health investments. It talks about ACOs, you know, and the idea of more community accountable uh, uh, organizations um, with uh, long-term health outcome focus. So with that, I got through a lot of slides in 20 minutes. Um, I will stop. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for the work you're doing. This is so exciting. I want to thank the Aspen Institute for convening. Uh, just amazing, terrific work. And I look forward in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. I look forward in the next 10 minutes or so to have a discussion and hear your questions. And thanks for being here. Sorry to talk so fast, but I wanted to listen. Patrick John Rob with yeah. the National Coalition. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations on uh, tremendous progress. It's exciting. Yeah. Uh, the pace of change is exciting, too. Yeah. Uh, two things that I wanted to hear uh, a little bit more about. One, you mentioned in passing consumer incentives. Mm -hmm. uh, are those things that um, you could do through the Innovation Center, or are those things that require legislation? And the second question is, what today are the barriers uh, that you are facing to moving even further. Yeah, so on the first one, if it's if it's benefit increasing to consumers, it's allowed within the current statutory construct. So incentives, you know, lower copays, things that are not reducing benefits. Actually in statute we're not allowed to reduce benefits. So if people wanted uh, to put shorthand on it. If you wanted carrots and sticks as opposed to just carrots, you would need statutory authority. We I do have the th statutory authority to use carrots or positive incentives. And, and barriers? Oh, barriers. I'm trying to think how to answer. So, um, how to answer this one. So, um, the, the largest, ch one of the largest challenges right now is, is honestly within a resource-constrained government construct. How do you drive innovation at the, how do you help foster and drive innovation at the scale and speed we need? Um, so we're doing, I won't give the details of this because I probably shouldn't, but we're doing some brainstorming the Innovation Center about the next round. And you can tell people are like, oh my gosh. The Innovation Center in total has 230 people on board. It probably needs on the order of 500. Um, just to be staffed internally. Um, uh, so I think there's some real just 
operational speed challenges. We're doing things like lean processing, things I won't go into now, that I started in other parts of CMS, and now we're bringing it into the CMS Innovation Center. But it's, it's a challenging environment to go as quickly as you'd want to. And there's always this balance, too, of you don't want to go so quickly that you're not sort of bringing stakeholders along with you, if that makes sense. Sorry, yeah, you can tell me who to go to. Michael Cook, I'm uh, co-chair of the healthcare practice at a law firm, Lyles Parker. Are you folks doing any work on um, all-payer type systems? And I'm not talking about just the Maryland Hospital. I'm talking yeah. about same methodology, even if it's not the same exact rate, maybe 101% of delta for. Yep. Uh, yes is the short answer. What this is. This meeting is actually like my fifth meeting of the day. So meeting number like two was the State Innovation Center model director, for example. And we're having a lot of, um, uh, so she's a former CEO, came into government, gave up her CEO job after like 25 years to run the state innovation models. Um, uh, and um, we are doing a lot of work with states to move to multi-payer or all-payer. Um, and really, um, some of them are taking that on in a very real way. Um, they aren't to the Maryland example yet, but we actually had a discussion this morning about for states that wanted to go towards uh, a Maryland type model, you know, how could we enable that? What would that look like? So I think that multi-payer aspect is a critical focus of the Innovation Center, and I think both in SIM and other models, how do we, you know, ACOs 2.0 could be broader than Medicare. Maybe it's more of a multi-payer construct. I'll try to br answer briefly to make sure. I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. I'm a primary care physician, <clears throat> so this sort of the sharp end of the stick. Um, I was interested in your, your mention of the 30 gastroenterologists. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a lot of the extra cost uh, is driven by extra supply, um, and I don't see how any of these measures deal with the fact that probably the 30 gastroenterologists are doing way too many colonoscopies, although they're all indicated by the guidelines written by the gastroenterologists. And here in the metropolitan area, we are now going to have three um, proton beam radiation uh, centers at, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars each, and someone has to pay for that. Yes, let me, it's a, it's a great point uh, and question, I think. Um, I think the things we need to consider there, um, uh, one, in our sort of coverage policy, making sure we're covering things that are reasonable and necessary, but then to bring it to the um, uh, gastroenterology or other examples, how do you think about um, incentives, and actually some of this is on the Hill right now, which people have seen, sort of appropriate use guidelines and incentives that would really tie payment more to directly to a use, to appropriate use criteria that would be vetted, and then we could debate vetted by who. I think that's a good question. Um, uh, but really, how do you tie more payment to appropriate use? Some of the models, like ACOs and bundles, et cetera, I was in a system that started shifting our contracts. It did shift the way we thought about, you know, the MRI in the simplest sense became a coster instead of a revenue stream. Um, so how do we think about incentives that align with what's best, the best care for patients and appropriate use? Jack. Yeah, thanks, uh, Patrick, for your leadership. It's, um, <clears throat> it's encouraging that you're, you've taken this on with half the staff that you need. So I would like to um, ask you, you know, about in, in the, uh, the impressive, and who would have thought it would have happened, the ACO expansion across the country, the number of physicians that have taken this on. And I've, I've been consulting in the post-acute space as well as being chairman of the National Coalition yep. on Healthcare. But I'd like to, you know, ask if you think there's a way we could engage the patient um, by actually making a choice of being in you know, accountable care. In the, in the way that we, I mean, yeah. because right now patients can wander in and out, and so John's, adding on to John Rother's question, yep. how do we do that, and, and how do we reach out in, in the wider community for, to expand uh, value-based um, payments and consumer choice around value outside of the ACL model? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Um, let me talk about ways one could think about doing that without, um, so, uh, one way would be a proactive choice. So you have a ACO next version that is literally beneficiaries proactively saying, I'm with this ACO. In return, there could be lower co-pays for seeing providers in that ACO, et cetera, but you're truly enabling choice. You know, a step back from that is things like attestation where you ask beneficiaries, are you willing to attest you're with this ACO? It's not lower co-pays or anything else, but we're 
you know, it's a psychological, you're attesting, and maybe it becomes an attribution we're attesting. By attesting, you are in that ACO's cohort, so they will treat you um, as a more linked beneficiary that's made a proactive choice. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways we could think about doing this. Obviously, the first version of, of ACOs did not do that, because I think, I think rightfully so, honestly, trying to set up See, you know, was this a viable model? I think as we think about next versions, you know, we've had people that came in, come in that basically say you need something between your current ACOs and health plans. Um, and then you can talk about what the parameters would be, but where beneficiaries are making a choice, it's a provider network, it's not a plan, you know, there's um, potentially consumer incentives to, uh, they've made that choice that now if they stay in network, they have things like lower co-pays. I think they're interesting ideas to think about, if that's helpful. Thanks for your excellent presentation. Uh, Keith Martin, the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. I'm intrigued by the, the comment you made about the integration between health, ed health education and social services. Yeah. Um, we know if we can be an incredible platform to deal with the social determinants of health and dramatically reduce demands on the healthcare system. Can you share with us some examples of where that's taking place? Oh, I may have to ask you the question back, but let me... Uh, um, let me try, but then others may have better examples, honestly, and I always worry because I may name examples that aren't the best examples. But I think, so some of our state innovation models, it, it's a very direct link between their public health and social service and infrastructure and their clinical delivery system. So they've sort of got that triad and they're really working at it. Um, at the city level, I'm aware of some cities, and you could ask, could the Innovation Center put something out that encourages other cities or geographies that are essentially saying, you know, we want to be a community that's accountable for health results. You know, we'll, we'll work with you on the right outcome measures and sort of cost metrics. I think um, there's some communities doing that. It was sort of on one of those slides. I mean, you could argue, does, does the innovation portfolio need something between sort of provider-based incentives and state incentives? Is there anything at a more uh, community, city, et cetera, geography? Um, you, you mentioned global health. I also, we, um, you know, there are other countries that have tighter integration on some of these services. So we could certainly look globally to see, are there some that are successful? How did they do that? It may not be uh, completely adoptable here, but maybe it's adaptable here. Maybe there's parts that we can learn from that and we could adapt and bring into our system. Any last questions? Uh, Rodney Peel with the optometrist, following up on yeah. some of the the ACO discussion, what kind of timeline are you on for uh, ACOs 2.0? And also, do you need m more, uh, c Congress was somewhat specific in parts of the ACA about the, AC about the shared savings program. Do you need changes made at the legislative level? Um, sadly, I won't be able to answer either of those questions as directly as you would like. So on the, on the, um, you know, on the 2.0, I think we're having those discussions now. We look forward to input, engaging with communities on what that might look like and, and stakeholders. Um, you know, there's a whole part of the process that I literally don't have control over, so I, I couldn't predict exactly how that plays out. Um, on the congressional aspect, un unfortunately, what I always have to say, which is true, is that, you know, if Congress, if, if people want to talk to Congress about changes that are made, then they come to us and we provide technical assistance on what that might mean. Um, uh, so, unfortunately, can't go into detail there. Sorry about that. Um, well, th One more question? Okay. Anyone else? All right. Oh. oh. <laughs> I was this close. <laughs> I'm from your partner, organ sister organization, AHRQ. So. Oh, um, but it, yeah. it, the interesting question about the social yeah. determinants of health and um, might CMMI yeah. um, incentivize a, a other local communities I guess what my question is, is I don't, because I don't see that happening at the federal level. I mean, how do you get agriculture and, mm -hmm. and HHS and, and yeah. you know, all together to make that happen at the federal level? Or is there some stuff going on at the federal level? I think that's a great question. I don't have an answer. So let me give you some thoughts. So I think, one, you could try to incentivize it at the federal level. I mean, the state innovation models on some level, the original dollars we put out was like a a, literally a million dollars to design, but then you like see these groups come in that are the whole state health infrastructure broadly. So I mean, there might be some creative things you could do that 
you know, our federal seed money to start the conversation, if you will. Um, I also think in the, in the state models, we're already having discussions, you know, some of these states are very large, so do they need to break down into sort of geographies? Um, because, you know, the classic example, Southern California, very different than Northern California, and then the parameters within them, so do they need to break down some of their work, uh, either even a level below that. So not a, I don't know that there's like one answer, but I think those are the sort of the thing, the aspects to think about. Well, thanks a lot for having me. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you so much, Dr. Conway. I really appreciate that you have carved out this much time with us, because I know that you're back to back on, on the meetings. And I also know that one of our authors would have been here today, but he's working for you. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I got that. <laughs> but I got you. Uh, Dr. Conway is going to have to race off. Uh, I was told by his staff if I didn't deliver him, he would never be able to come back. So, <laughs> and we want you at the at the Care Innovation Summit. So, thank you so much. Um, our next panel uh, is the actual authors of our publication. Um, those that could show up that are not working for Dr. Conway, uh, and it's going to be moderated by our Susan Denser, who is our um, extraordinary friend of the Aspen Institute, has been for years. Uh, she is the senior advisor to the president of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, and also an on-air uh, health correspondent for the PBS NewsHour, formerly uh, editor-in-chief of Health Affairs. And so I'm going to ask Susan to come forward and she will introduce our panelists and they will sit there and she will sit wherever she wants. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fran Marie. Great to be with all of you today and to follow uh, Patrick's excellent presentation. My uh, panelists are joining me up here, and as Fran Marie said, they are among the original authors of this excellent report on reinventing healthcare. You have uh, their entire bios, or quote, uh, I should say, full bios in their uh, in your packet. But I will just briefly introduce them all now. Uh, first, we're delighted to have with us Basa Chowdhury who's a consulting physician at IBM Research. He is, of course, an MD and a PhD. In his work with IBM, he develops new analytic methods and technologies to improve performance at the point of care, and he also works on issues related to healthcare policy for IBM and has brought that terrific perspective to this report. Uh, next to him is Carol Brezens, who holds the Betty, sorry, we're getting some feedback here. Uh, who holds the Betty Jacobs Endowed Professorship in the Department of Health Systems Administration at the School of Nursing and Health Studies at Georgetown. Uh, she joined the University School of Nursing and Health Studies after 19 years with the Rand Corporation, where she most recently held the position of Senior Economist and uh, Director of Health Economics Finance and Organization. Now I think we've lost the mic all together, but we'll, we'll get it back. Okay. Uh, also delighted, well, let's see, we don't have Joe here at the moment, so we'll <laughs> skip Joe. Uh, let's uh, move to Anjali Jane, who's a, management, a managing consultant and senior scientist at the Lewin Group, a health and human services research and policy group. She was formerly an assistant professor in pediatrics and health policy at Children's National Medical Center and uh, the George Washington University. And her research has focused on children's health and public health in particular, uh, especially in the area of obesity prevention. Uh, and then finally, Brent Parton is with us, and he is the founder of Shout America, which is an organization launched to assert the interests of young Americans in a sustainable, effective, and equitable healthcare system. He's program director there, and he oversees the development and management of their educational programming, their outreach, and research. Uh, during healthcare reform, I guess during the first phase, since we're now in to phase 2.0, or full implementation, he worked with national youth advocacy organizations to cultivate a network of 10,000 young Americans committed to building policy support uh, on uh, health and economic issues. So with that, uh, the, the report divides up into three uh, categories of recommendations. One around generally promoting innovation, 
one around accessing health information, and then a third very important one around engaging consumers. And all of our panels today contributed to various aspects of that, but they naturally gravitate toward one of those uh, pods versus the other. Uh, so we're going to start today with just a brief uh, overview from Bossett to just encapsulate some of the the totality of the report and what he thinks are the key features. And then we're going to move to discussing these various areas, the uh, promoting innovation in general, accessing health information, and engaging consumers. And highlighting uh, what you will hear more of in the next panel, which is some of the actual on the ground innovative organizations that are walking the walk, talking the talk, and actually putting in place, overcoming whatever barriers exist to actually uh, implement innovative new approaches to the delivery of health care. So Bassett, we'll start by turning things over to you. Thanks, Susan. <clears throat> so, you know, I think one of the great things about this project was we're not only sort of looking at innovation from the standpoint of what is the health system doing wrong, but what are we doing right? And I think this was a really underlying premise to what we were hoping to accomplish here. Because on the one hand, sort of uh, one of the questions we asked ourselves was, how is it possible that in certain ways healthcare is so remarkably innovative and in other ways, so completely uninnovative. And the purpose of that question was to, was to really try to set up a system through which we could cross-pollinate one to the other, how we could take best practices around innovation, identify them, learn them, and then inform them um, through some mechanism through which they can diffuse throughout the system. Um, and I think that that's, it led to a really sort of interesting set of insights, many of which are captured in this report. There's new afterwards in the report, which describes sort of some of what we did particularly getting out into the field and looking at innovation in, in sort of day-to-day -day practice, which was another really innovative part of the project. And really what we were trying to do in the report was one, you know, we had identified the sort of barriers initially, but really the goal was to really set the context for what we do in terms of finding innovation out in the field. And I think one of the great parts of the project and being part of it was really, we kind of took the point of standpoint that innovation doesn't just happen in Washington, it happens everywhere, it means it doesn't, it's not precluded from happening in Washington, it's just not dependent on what we do here. And what we really tried to do is focus on how do we go out into different parts of the country and really learn on a first-hand basis what's going out in terms of new innovative practices people are doing. And I think that's just such a commendable um, set of uh, visionary activities from both the Institute and WellPoint. Um, and I congratulate sort of both for really getting out there and looking what, at what's going on. Um, you know, briefly we covered those, those areas that Susan talked about, I'll just touch briefly on one area in particular right now, which was in health information technology and the use of data. That's sort of the area I focus in on. I think it's obviously it's a really exciting, promising field. People are doing really interesting things. Healthcare right now is in a pattern that most other industries or many other industries have gone through with respect to health uh, information technology adoption. The first stage tends to be people investing in infrastructure to enhance operational capacity. Once people buy the systems, they tend to say, well, what are we going to do with these systems now? and that really requires turning data into insight through some kind of a set of analytics. And the last part tends to be taking that insight and then integrating inside of a business <coughs> process. So I think we're sort of in between stages one and two in healthcare. And I think a lot of the, the lessons that or models that we'll see from this afternoon in the panels will really show the path towards moving that forward. Thank you. Great, okay. So, Moving on, again, these other areas, promoting innovation and engaging consumers, and this does not, of course, preclude anybody else addressing the, uh, the information areas, but we'll, so we'll come back to those in a moment. Carol, give us your thoughts on uh, where you think some of the very important uh, elements of these recommendations lie. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about consumer engagement, and I think when we look historically at what are some of the barriers that have kept consumers from operating in the healthcare marketplace in the way that they operate in other marketplaces, and I think we can think about those as informational and <coughs> financial and cultural, and when we think about the informational barriers to consumers <coughs> operating more uh, rationally, there's been informational barriers around price you know, having enough price information, and not just being able to call providers and get different prices, but having a common metric. So providers might bundle prices in different ways, and trying to understand how those prices are, are different across providers is something that WellPoint is doing with their care comparison tool and many other um, private insurers and, and public insurers as well are trying to help with. And so then we can also think about quality as an informational barrier, and certainly there's been hospital report cards and the like, 
And then finally, there's been informational barriers around not just provider choices, but also treatment choices. So when we think about consumers trying to think about being more involved in decision making, where do they get the information on trade-offs between different kinds of treatment options? And not just whether or not they have that information, but also how do they process that information? We know from behavioral economics that consumers can get overloaded with either price or quality information about providers or about different treatment options. And packaging that information in ways in which consumers can use it to make meaningful choices um, is really critical. And I think we've seen lots of movement and innovation around providing consumers with information in ways that they can really use it to make more meaningful choices in the healthcare market, <coughs> marketplace. But even if you had all the information that consumers would want at the ready, I think without the financial incentive to use that information, um, that information might not be pushing consumers in the way in which we want them to. And so we've seen a lot of innovation, both sort of a blunt instrument of something like a high deductible health plan or a consumer defined health plan, where consumers are more at risk for all care. And one of the challenges there is really that it's a blunt instrument and consumers might stint not just on the care we don't want them to get, the extra care, but also research has shown sometimes they don't get the preventive care that they might, not, that they might need. And so we've also seen the advent of things like value-based insurance design. Patrick talked about value-based purchasing from a, from a payer perspective. From a consumer perspective, it's the same idea. How do we get consumers to be financially incentivized to choose value care? And so the idea of changing deductibles or co-payments based on how valuable that care is is great. And, and the devil's in the details, though. Um, trying to sort of map out that space is, is a big challenge of what all the different treatments options are and how much consumers should pay for that. And then third, I'll, and, and I'll end here, is just um, the idea of cultural factors as well. So even with financial incentives and even with information, those can be two <coughs> necessary but still not sufficient conditions for pushing consumers into acting in the marketplace in which, in which we want them to. And here we can see you know, the way in which providers and patients speak to each other um, is important. I was looking at the, the Patient Centered Outcome Research Institute, or PCORI, has funded some new grants, and one of those grants was around um, shared decision making around behavioral health care. And in particular, this grant was to take an intervention that had been previously tried um, to help patients get more involved in their behavioral health care, but it had failed because the providers there hadn't been a provider component. So patients were more engaged and tried to share in the decision making more, maybe the providers weren't quite ready. And so this PCORI grant was to do a provider component so that you had both the patient and the provider. And to me, that's really the essential piece of shared decision making is the education and the, the innovation on both ends, bringing providers and patients together. And it starts with medical education, but it can continue to, um, you know, throughout the life course of a physician. And Anjali, I know, was also very much drawn to the consumer engagement. So please feel free to start well, there, but also branch into areas yeah, of the report. Obviously, there's a, a lot of overlap between these areas. And um, Joe was supposed to speak a little bit more about the system at large, so I'll take his place a little bit. Um, when we started working on this paper, I think it was probably about a year ago at least. And so I have to say that so much has happened uh, in the way of innovation. I feel like all of these islands have sprung up and that they will eventually full form um, more of a um, continuous landmass in terms of innovation projects. So I, I was going to, you, you can read the report, but I'd like to comment on a couple other things that hopefully will just get the conversation going um, to think about where we might try to innovate in our health system next. Um, so one of the things that I was glad that Patrick reminded me, he was a pediatrician, and that someone else had brought up the social determinants of health. And I think all of us in this room recognize that a lot of what ends up in the doctor's office really starts um, much more broadly and much earlier um, than we're seeing. And so one of the things that I felt like was very evident this morning is how much we're innovating around disease and the care of disease, and not so much around longer-term outcomes, um, the social and early determinants of health, pediatric issues, mental health. Um, so I would really encourage all of us in this room who have a role to play to, to think more broadly about that and what does innovation 
of not a disease-centered system look like, but a health-centered system. And I think it probably looks quite different than the kinds of models that we're looking at right now. Um, the other thing is there's been some, you know, quite a bit of talk about consumer incentives, and it struck me how much consumer incentives are really about financial incentives. And for most consumers, I think, including all of us in this room, um, the financial incentives for health are probably very small compared to all the other incentives for health. So again, to think a little bit more uh, creatively about how um, consumers' incentives for a uh, higher quality of life, um, a longer um, and higher quality of life might also play into the system. Um, the last thing I'd like to say, and I wish Dr. Conway was still here um, to hear it, but maybe some of his um, um, colleagues can communicate to him, is you know there's a, there, there is at least written down on paper this idea of health in all policies. And um, somebody asked about in agriculture, for instance, and housing and all of that. Um, I'm, I'd like to just pose an idea of thinking about it a little bit further, both on the federal and um, beyond level, uh, you know, in and outside of Washington, is how can we start to think about health in all industries? Because really, we're made up of industries. How can we start to think about making healthy foods more economical for, food, for the big food industries to make? How can we think about um, you know, mental health um, for employers and employees um, in that industry, um, and housing and public transportation and all of those things? So I, I do think that on the federal level, there is a commitment to, at the policy level, to think about health issues. But I don't think the incentives beyond that are really, really even close to being aligned in that, in that general direction. Um, I often think that you know, the, um, the, a lot of the big food companies, for instance, are making huge profits that contribute to our uh, gross national product. Um, but then the, the payment is felt in the health sector. Um, so how do, we, how do we sort of take these big ships and start to align them together and turn them around so that they're facing a slightly different direction or moving in a slightly different direction? Um, so that, those were sort of my thoughts from this morning, and I encourage discussion. Brent. Great. Brent. Sure. Um, I've been very fortunate to be a part of this experience. It's been a learning journey for me, and I guess I, one thing that I have taken away from all this is that it's, it's hard to debate that we're in somewhat of a revolutionary moment when it comes to innovation, particularly in the area of consumer engagement. You can look at the various technologies and new types of care models and capacities that are out there, many of which are, gonna be, are highlighted in the paper, and you'll hear from some of those innovative solutions on the panel later. Uh, Patrick also talked a lot about the new types of incentives that are coming out of the Innovation Center, and payers are also innovating with sort of models for getting consumers engaged. So, I took away from this, you know, on the supply side of consumer engagement, we're in a very exciting time. So my question to sort of stimulate dialogue is, what is the demand for consumer engagement? Um, how do we stimulate it? What are the ways that we can stimulate it? Because Carol laid out some pretty intensive barriers for consumer engagement. Um, we've talked about sort of the information overload issue, where there's tons of information out there. What's good information? What isn't good information? So there's a there's a sort of a tipping point right there. But I, I'd like to point out sort of one idea that I think I've pulled out of listening to Dr. Conway and listening to the different innovations as well as other speakers on this is how can we bring consumers to the table, maybe outside of, as Angelique said, the financial incentives. Um, I think you have to look at sort of, you, could, you can look to other industries and sort of what gets people engaged, what gets them to share information, it, at the end of the day, it's, an, it's a sense of value to them, economic, social. Um, you look at people turn over their entire life of information to get a credit card and make buying something more convenient. That's all they do. And we have a lot of issues in health about that happening. Or if you look at Facebook, people are turning over tons of personal information to get some sort of social value out of it. So can we start thinking in the idea of how can consumer engagement from the supply side Maybe it's a PR issue, maybe it's rethinking some of the models, but 
what is going to be the end value to the user and make that sort of the, the focus of the discussion. And I, I always like the idea that we call them, uh, them health plans when you're signing up in an exchange. It's your, it's your health plan. What if we use that term more literally and we started talking about, well, what is your health goal? And a big part of consumer engagement could be early ownership about establishing shared goals for what the, what the end result would be for consumer engagement. Um, I think that would also lead to a lot of the, uh, a more strategic way of approaching it in the sense that it wouldn't be a lot of emails back and forth that providers have to respond to and that patients have to constantly be engaged. I think that's the last thing that they want on many fronts. But it would be very strategic around set goals, around quality of life, around, as uh, Dr. Conway laid out, sort of a lifelong conception of health. And uh, to that point, I think it can be done on the individual level, but also at the community level. And I think we talked a little bit in, in earlier about what would a community health plan look like what if, a, if a health system was invested in sort of doing these community health needs assessments and creating a strategic vision in terms of what, do, what are the goals for our community, you can coordinate people when there's a very deliberate reason to coordinate. And so when it comes to bringing in education, social services, and different industries within a community, let's be clear about the goals. And it's not fluff. It's something actually of all places that's buried in IRS code, I think, right now, is a lot of nonprofit hospitals are, have to do these community health needs assessments. Um, it's what's going to help enable them to preserve a nonprofit status and sort of the, and with uh, the dawning of the age of uh, universal coverage to be a charity hospital or to have a community benefit, we're, we're seeing a change in that conception. So can we leverage those touch points to really have a much more strategic vision about what the goals are in terms of engaging individuals as well as the community? Two quick things that I think are uh, real opportunities for this, and I'll, I'll do my own personal plug here in the sense that the reason I'm here is for a particular lens of young people. I think that we're entering a millennial moment with healthcare. We're a matter of days away from a lot of young people getting into the formal healthcare system for the first time. What a better time to start talking about this idea of a more strategic lifelong health plan. What if that was a prerequisite to signing up into the exchange, that you had a very clear agenda for why you wanted to get into the exchanges, why you wanted to get covered, which is a big question right now and we won't go into all that. Uh, and then the last piece is I think we have to think not just of young people as being transformative in terms of their own needs, but as caregivers for an aging baby boom generation. Um, a lot of us will live remotely from our parents as they age. Home-based care is gonna become the norm. I think that creates an opportunity from a, from a demographic standpoint to start looking at uh, or building upon a lot of the innovative things that are going on with consumer engagement, not just from their own standpoint, but for caring for their loved ones as they age. Great. Well, thanks to all four of you. So what we've just heard, first of all, from Bossett was that a point of departure for this report was figuring out not just what are we doing wrong in healthcare, but what are we doing right, identify those aspects of uh, positive change and innovation and figure out a way to best diffuse them. And you mentioned the case of uh, health information technology in particular as being in this interim state where we've invested in the infrastructure. We're starting to derive the insights from collecting all this information. Now we just got to figure out how to funnel it back into the system effectively and change the system. From Carol, we heard about the importance of consumer engagement, and you heard the, the barriers to that that are considerable, and I won't repeat them, but also some potential to begin to overcome them. Uh, and of course, identified in the report were many examples of, of entities that are trying to gear up to overcome them. And, and, and then when we moved to Anjali and Brent, I think thought we moved too broadly to the field of what's, so what's, where does health fit into all of this more broadly, <laughs> not just about health care. And it's interesting, uh, both of you have made the point that in effect that uh, what, it, what, what, is, uh, what matters about your health has much more to do with, with what happens outside the health care system. We know that health care broadly really only explains about 10% of your overall health status and certainly premature mortality. Access to health care or lack thereof only explains about 10% of premature death. Most of it is all this other stuff. It's your social and economic circumstances, it's your level of education, it's your genetics, et cetera. Uh, but health care really plays a minor role. So it, it, it's fascinating that both you all as well as Patrick 
uh, and some of his descriptions of the state innovation models, people aren't now talking so much about reinventing health care as they are talking about reinventing our entire understanding of health and how we achieve health, and health care only being one avenue to that. Uh, and that, of course, is, I'll just share that that's a journey that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has also gone on, uh, because the foundation's increasing focus is on how we instill a culture of health in America. And there are many ways to do that, only one of which is to have a more effective health care system. It's really going to start with backwards, uh, upstream, with some of these social and economic determinants of health. So let's start there, uh, because again, many of the innovators you identified are addressing the health care side of it. How, uh, and Patrick, of course, was asked this question too, who's doing the innovation around the health space in particular? Is there the potential, as Brent just raised, for maybe starting with asking new enrollees and health insurance exchanges to talk about a health plan for themselves as much as a health care plan? I mean, how do we really foster innovation and movement forward there? Anjali, let's come back to you on that. Wow. Um, I was just supposed to ask the question. So <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm a pediatrician as well, and so I do think um, I do think that the family is probably the place to start. And I think, um, you know, I just, um, a friend of mine has been trying to get pregnant for a long time and just told me last night that she finally is. And, you know, it struck me that um, there is an incredible opportunity at that point to really try to think about um, reaching parents and families and new parents about what they want their life and their child's life and their family's life to look like. Um, so I, you know, I don't think you can start early enough, really. But um, I would, you know, I would try to seize a little bit more on that opportunity when there are tons of questions <coughs> and lots of uncertainty and a, um, just immeasurable hope for what life can be like um, as a as a point where people are going to be incredibly motivated to think about some of those lifelong health issues and what they might do to, to create that, um, that dream. Carol? Yeah, so I'll just add that I think the health reform and the Affordable Care Act also pushes along this dimension. Um, Brent mentioned the community health needs assessments. Um, there's also provisions to encourage employers to do more testing of wellness programs, and I think that was happening in the private sector already, even without the ACA, to think you know, employers have an incentive to keep employees healthy, not just so that healthcare costs are lower, but to have more productive workforce. So the ACA, through a number of different provisions, really pushes on the population health, on investments in public health, preventive care, and that kind of dimension. Bassett? Yeah, I think the, <coughs> excuse me, the issue of social determinants of health is such an important one. Part of the, the challenge in the past has been, how do you put this into practice? Like, how do you operationalize different kinds of interventions, programs, policies? In certain ways, policies are the easiest or most direct thing to do on social determinants of health. But how do you really operationalize these things? I think one of the exciting things now is that when you look at data, particularly health care, health data in general, social data from different sectors of the economy, one of the really exciting things I sort of see coming is that we're going to have much more sophisticated, much more highly validated ways of trying to understand how social determinants of health impact people's lives and how we should um, develop interventions around that. And I think being able to bring to bear data from different sectors, whether it's agriculture or energy, you know, water consumption, and really try to figure out at a population and hopefully down to an individual level, what are the dynamics affecting geography's health, a person's health. You know, I don't think we can, we had the the kind of capacities we have now to do this did not exist before, and I think this is going to have a big impact in the future of how we think about these things. In fact, IBM in particular is uh, doing a lot to aid uh, specific cities now in collecting some of these data and understanding them. Do you want to say something about that? Sure. I mean, when you look at the, um, the cost of different kinds of instrumentation, particularly sensor data, um, it's just falling so rapidly, and it's so easy to produce these things. Um, that eventually we're going to have some kind of environment of ubiquitous computing, which basically means there's some kind of 
processing or data recording pretty much everywhere. Um, and this is so give take us that National Security Agency. Yeah, so yeah, we, we won't talk about that. <laughs> um, this is health. We're talking about health. We're talking about good things. Um, but you can start looking at, sort of, for instance, agriculture policy in a totally different way because you can start quantifying it um, across supply chains, I think, in very interesting ways. You can start looking at what is air quality like? Um, what are the determinants of air quality? How does that impact people's health? So you can ultimately sort of develop these closed loops of information where you can see, well, if air quality is X and ER utilization is Y, how do we think about what's going on in the so lives are, of are children? are there more kids showing up for asthma yes. treatment because the air quality in a particular city was bad on a given day? Exactly, and then we could start predicting that. Right? And so once you can start predicting something, you can really show in a very concrete way that you understand it and that you can develop a business case or a business model around doing something about it. Brent? Where do you see this playing out? I think it's, uh, you raise the very important point of, you know, 10% of health care is uh, what matters for health outcomes. Well, if you flip that over and say, where are we spending the majority of the resources? And obviously, we're heavily invested in health care versus prevention. It's probably even less than 10% that we spend on prevention and these other types of alternative health investments. But so I think that's an opportunity in a sense, is that you know, we have to look where we're spending the resources and what types of institutions do we have to utilize those resources to deliver certain things. And I think the change, to an extent, has to come from healthcare. I think people will expect that. I think that we have a, it's part of the American dream to have access to a doctor in healthcare and for a long time. So this conversation doesn't, can't be about, well, yeah, healthcare is good, but you know we want you to be more focused on these broader social issues. People are going to be confused and think you're just denying them something. So I think that it's the change does have to come from a where a lot of the resources are. Um, you can look at ho the hospital itself, redesign of the hospital. There's some interesting uh, uh, things that have been going on in that regard. In terms, of it's been built for a very deliberate purpose for the past six decades. How can it be redesigned to deliver on these different types of models? What types of partnerships can it look to build beyond its four walls? Um, the other thing is you look at the institution of medicine itself and how we train physicians. Um, so you can look at the existing sort of workforce that we have for healthcare and how can we amend the, and there's actually a, one of the innovations in the Ohio, from the Ohio State programs about how they're testing different sort of team-based models much earlier on to sort of have a more integrated look at care. But also it's gonna take new types of work uh, members of the workforce as well. I think looking at the health coaches is a very promising thing that's coming up and sort of how do we have these people who have a much uh, different perspective on the health system, but they're integrated with healthcare. That's where the resources are. And frankly, I think that's who the public trusts when it comes to making healthcare decision makings. And hopefully we can preserve that trust, but the transformation I think has to start within the institution itself. Yeah, I th just if I could just follow up on that. I think it's a really good point because I think a, a major strategic question we have in, in, as a country in terms of how we approach health is how much do we need to enhance the productivity of the healthcare sector in order to liberate resources that can then be reinvested to promote health both at the individual and population level. And I think we're kind of caught in that conundrum right now or mm -hmm. that sticking point that ultimately if these are fixed resources allocated to a very large sector of the economy, how do you essentially sort of this is a big retrofitting problem. Like, you have to sort of you know, yeah. shift an entire industry to a different orientation and a different production function. And that, I think, has to start, as Brian is saying, is that you have to liberate resources from somewhere. So that really has to come from making healthcare more productive, at least to start scaling the notion of health and what we can do about it in a very large national way. And to that point, uh, we often uh, use the word innovation and we see it through rose-colored glasses. We know that a lot of innovation, for innovation to really work, it has to, of necessity, be destructive innovation. It has to destroy old models and invent new ones. And that's part of what we're about to go through here as we, for example, pay hospitals less. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and we see right now just a almost a paralysis, say, in the hospital sector between people who can't uh, necessarily, it's not that they disagree with the model of moving care out of the hospital and preventing people from getting sick in the first place and getting rid of avoidable readmissions. It's just that it, right now it is completely uh, 
inimical to their revenue model. They need people in the hospital and they need readmissions. Uh, so how do we get past this and how do we unleash these forces of destructive innovation when they clearly are going to dislodge people from cr their current institutions, dislodge the CEOs, uh, shake up the boards, uh, push people into new forms of employment in the healthcare sector. This is not going to be a smooth glide path. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a good question, Susan, as always. Um, so one of the things that makes healthcare, I think, interesting is that it's a low margin, high waste business. High waste. Yes. Yeah. It's a low margin and high waste. There are very, very few industries that you can characterize along those two dimensions. So in a way, that's very depressing. In another way, it's very <laughs> hopeful. Um, and it's hopeful because if you were low margin and low waste, there's really a, not a lot of maneuvering room. But if you're low margins and low waste, then there's uh, high waste, there's opportunity. And I think for a lot of institutions in particular, they're going to have to start looking at that model. And I think the focus, particularly on the revenue generation side, is going to really have to, have to be much more on how do we create operational effectiveness? Which, and this is something most other industries and firms went through in a large way in the 80s and 90s. How do you really focus on operational effectiveness on a continuous basis? How do you focus on what your margins look like? And how do you really generate your business model around that? I mean, in the past, most healthcare business models have really revolved around the revenue model, and that's been it. But business models are much more complicated than that, and people have to think more broadly about what their business model looks like. And this is just something that goes on in other industries all the time. Um, so business model innovation is a really key part of healthcare reform. Anjali, you, you live in a system, this system of low margin and high waste, and right. I've also <laughs> observed it as, a, as, a, as an analyst. Well, I, I think of it more as maldistribution, I guess. Um, you know, we have a lot of specialists. We have too many. We don't have enough primary care. We certainly don't have enough behavioral health specialists. Um, I remember encountering many, uh, many times uh, residents that were in training that would say, you know, get even quite angry that they were being asked to do social work as opposed to medicine. And, you know, I think that that is a frustrating experience, um, partially because of the status differences between social workers and physicians, quite honestly, but also because the physicians were not trained to be effective or helpful or to feel rewarded for those efforts. And so I do think a lot of it is, um, you know, getting rid of the excess, um, but also replacing it with, um, with retraining and with relearning, and I think human beings in general want to learn new things um, as long as they can learn them effectively and use them effectively. And I, I think the practice of medicine will also become more rewarding in, if we are truly addressing the patient's needs, which currently we are not. So um, there is a lot of waste, but there's also a lot of need. Uh, Brent, speaking on behalf of the uh, millennial generation for a moment, <laughs> what expectations do you think uh, people who are going to be coming into the healthcare system uh, in your age bracket and below uh, for the first time will have about how they will engage with the healthcare system, particularly on some of these issues, the more fundamental health issues? How do I preserve and protect my health and extend my health over time? I, I think to that point, um, you know, there's I think there's what they what they'll expect is, in many respects, the trend broader trends that we've just seen in how care is delivered. I mean, going to a primary care physician seems like it's going to a dentist's office now in many respects. And I've talked to some people about this, and they say, you know, you spend a lot of time with the nurse practitioner, you do a lot of things, um, you see the doctor for a couple minutes, he kind of looks at you, and that's about it. And I think that, frankly, right now they don't really have any reason to expect any different from that standpoint. So from what, that's the reality, I think, of what they're, what they're seeing. Um, in terms of the broader expectations about sort of a more integrated health thing, I think it would be a pleasant surprise to a lot of people. But when we look at really what, are, what, are, what is going to drive someone into a system that's really, in many respects, not been a part of, or not been the priority, I think is the better way of putting it, of, a formal healthcare for a long time in, a, in an acute system that waits really until you get sick before it's 
before they see you. Um, I think that's going to take some time. But where I think I make one observation for, this, for the, where there's promise is that I've actually seen a lot of innovation with student health services on universities across the country. Um, if you wanted to see what an integrated health ecosystem looks like, colleges and universities have really taken the lead in sort of modeling things around. They have sort of a primary care frontline student health service that everybody can go in quickly and get convenient care, get their you know, z pack when they're not feeling well and so on very quickly. At the same time, student health services in many places is also integrated with the food that's being served in the cafeteria. There's access to the gym, access to mental health, access to counselors. Universities have invested a lot of money in creating sort of these systems. F for good reason, I think, in, in many respects, in that they're, they, they have the resources to do that. But at the same time, it's about sort of creating an environment that's conducive to a quality of life that, frankly, students are paying a lot for. But that's a whole other issue that we'll talk about. But, so I think that there's some interesting touch points where students will come out of these very integrated uh, environments into sort of a healthcare world that they, frankly, have trouble navigating. And that's where we've tried to do a lot of our work with sort of health literacy 2.0 and what that world means. And right now, I think they're expecting to, to see something that's very convenience-based and walking in and not really getting much interaction from physician, period. So the question I guess we could ask is how do we create an environment after they graduate from universities that has this level of integration and connection to other health inputs uh, beyond just health care? Uh, that, that really is the question that all of you have put on a table in a particular way, one way or the other. So with that, we're going to open it up to questions and uh, comments and uh, uh, short speeches masquerading as questions or anything else that you all have in mind for uh, today, uh, addressing again any of these very important areas around promoting innovation, accessing health information, or engaging consumers. And uh, indeed, uh, Joe was going to talk a little bit more about change on the system level, but if, if that's a topic uh, we would like to come back to again on this panel, we can. So questions, comments? Those are, yes, we've got one right there. Let's get a mic over. while everyone else is formulating a question. Um, let, I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin, a primary care physician. There's another way to look at this, or at least I wonder if you've thought about it. The healthcare system is very expensive, and uh, healthcare is only 10% of the social determinants of health. Maybe we should be moving people out of the healthcare system for things like diet and exercise and flu shots, because they can be delivered much more inexpensively elsewhere, say for children, by the schools. Um, healthcare used to be delivered there, and the doctors went crazy in the 1940s uh, and moved those things into the doctor's office. Maybe the most efficient way to deliver that kind of service is to move it out of the healthcare system. Well, and indeed, one of the recommendations in the report is to drastically beef up uh, school-based clinics as one example of that. Uh, and of course, we also see some natural migration of this now. Uh, doctors' offices have, by and large, given up uh, the responsibility to provide flu shots to the nation's pharmacies. But how do we accelerate just that kind of movement and, and, and free up some of the resources in the, in the high-cost settings, Vasa, that you refer to? Um, so again, another very good question, very difficult question. Um, so in general, there's a, there's a very large mismatch between um, the kind of demand, the organic demand we have for medical care and <coughs> supply function. And in general, the demand is often engaged in, on the supply side a, in a much more expensive setting than is necessary. So one of the, sort of at a macro level, what's going to be required to increase productivity in healthcare is to better <laughs> match supply and demand, and particularly um, putting demand in the lowest cost setting possible, not sort of a very sort of large picture kind of view on this. But what it really means is, is we're really going to have to f figure out what is the, what kinds of medical services <coughs> can be mapped to which portions of, the, of a workforce and in what settings to produce the most efficient re use of resources. Um, and I think this sort of partly gets this notion of disruptive innovation. And oftentimes people think of disruptive innovation as Google. Right, or some really fancy technology. And that was never the original idea. 
the original idea of disruptive innovation was can you produce an innovation that's quote unquote just good enough for people to adopt it given its price point. So it's something oftentimes that isn't necessarily as good as what's standard, but it can be done cheaper, faster, better, and of a larger sector of the market. And I think that's really what we're going to have to do in healthcare, create low cost interventions that map demand um, to lower cost environments. And, and that gets us back uh, to the whole issue of, for example, hospital provision of services, because we know that hospital-based services, even for the same service, are more expensive than when those are provided on an out, in an outpatient setting. And that's because the hospitals are covering a higher overhead mm -hmm. with everything that they price. And I guess that, that takes us back to a comment, uh, Carol, that you made about price transparency. Mm -hmm. Because as we have this increased movement now, uh, companies like Safeway actually telling their uh, employees, we will pay a reference price, say, for a colonoscopy that's not as high as the $6,000 that you will get uh, that, that you would be charged to get this colonoscopy at the hospital. Uh, if you'd like to get the $6,000 colonoscopy, that's okay, but it's on you. <laughs> we'll give you $1,200 for the colonoscopy, and that will drive you to the outpatient setting, uh, et cetera. As we, as we move more and more down the road of transparency, is that going to really motivate consumers to shift? Because so far, we haven't seen a lot of signs that consumers will move on the basis of, uh, of, of information about pricing, or for that matter, quality. Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the innovations you can look to in terms of where care is delivered efficiently, or at, at least cost, we've seen retail clinics pop up. And one of the characteristics of the retail clinics, the minute clinics, is a very clear delineation of what the prices are for different, for different things. And so, um, but I do think it's important that even with price information, consumers also have to have the financial incentive to seek care out at the most um, efficient place. And so without having some skin in the game, either in terms of some cost sharing or deductibles, um, those prices aren't going to have the effects that we want them to have. And it does you know, strike me too that, that part of what the Affordable Care Act tries to do is to incentivize care being delivered in a more low cost setting including by the provision of insurance. So if we can keep people um, out of the emergency room or out of hospitals and control their care with preventive care before it gets exasperated and we have to go to a high cost setting, that's part of the efficiency that the ACA tries to drive as well. Just one thing I'd like to add though is um, at the point you have to think about where the patient or the consumer is at the point of making those decisions. Um, they are at their most vulnerable um, usually with a lot of fear. Um, and so that's not really a, a good state of mind to be in when trying to compare cost and price. Because price may easily be no object. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the um, things to think about in the system is sort of how to, um, how to defer some of those decisions to a time when there can be more rationality so that it's not, um, it's not a desperate choice at that point. Just one quick thing, and then the Minute Clinic one is always an interesting point to me. It's, it's the price transparency, it's also the convenience element of it that I think is, makes it very attractive and it's quick in, quick out, and that's attracted a lot of people. One thing that I always thought would be interesting, I know that you know, decades ago they had, industrial medicine was a big thing, where large employers would literally employ a doctor or nurse on site. I think it would be, if we could have done a case study or a comparative <laughs> effectiveness test of the corporations and where the savings were, if they would have kept them employed for them, buying their care, having it be convenient, having it be transparent on site versus over time changing, it would be an interesting study that I know we can no longer accomplish, but maybe we can try a, a new round of it. And as you all know, we may be going back to the future as more large companies look precisely at that approach again. Uh, not, let's take another couple of questions here. Michael Cook again, uh, uh, health lawyer, chair, co-chair of a health practice in a law firm. Uh, how to, um, in terms of the Minute Clinic, I mean, if you're going to get that to work, it would seem to me that you've got to integrate it ra with rather a larger prac, larger group of providers so that docs stop viewing them as competitors and start viewing them as, as um, 
uh, as possibly uh, revenue centers for the docks as well as a payment system. But I ran into something this weekend. I played golf uh, with a, um, a woman who actually has a, uh, is a personal trainer for 70 to 90 year olds. And she does this in a particular setting where there's a pool. But the biggest, the biggest factor drawing these folks in is the fact that afterwards they have wine and cheese parties, which may not work for hell. <laughs> But it keeps. But but one of the great components of uh, even with personal it care. Guideline. What? <laughs> <laughs> but it may not fit the guidelines. But what it does do is provide them the social setting after they've started to lose all their friends. Mm -hmm. Have you seen anything like that happening where you actually bring that into an insure part of an insurance or part of a Medicare program? I know we see some of that with silver slippers, but can you see it br uh, more broadly? Yeah, Anybody? I don't know if this is an exact parallel, but I think there's been a rise in sort of the group visit for diabetics or the group visit for people with hypertension, where you have some communication about some of the challenges that you're facing. You still have a private visit with your physician, but there's some learning that goes on and, you know, creating a cohort of people that have that shared experience. And, and, and peer support. Yeah, yeah. And, and to your point about miniclinics, I think, you know, one of the big challenges is is that going to be a place? Is it going to take away from the continuity of care, you know, and the provision of the preventive care that you need, or is it indeed, you know, supplemental and helpful? We do have the example of, for example, the ACOs that Walgreens is involved in, right. which, of mm -hmm. which there are now three, yeah. and that is utterly on the style of integrating into the broader medical practice. They don't see themselves as taking the place of primary care physicians. They see themselves as an adjunct, and that's why they're exploring through the ACO mechanism how they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and would you guess that we'll be seeing more of that, Basif, from? I think so. You know, I think we're, we're first of all, we're, we're completely reorganizing how physician practices are set up now, obviously. And more than half of all physicians are employed. That percentage is likely going to increase. Um, so healthcare is moving, and something we talked about in the report is moving really from a cottage industry, where it had these informal sort of ad hoc organizational arrangements and business models, to a mo sort of a much more modern industry. And this happened in the insurance industry 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, it has happened to many industries. It happened to finance in the 1970s and the 1980s. So we're going through this now with healthcare and sort of how providers will be organized, what networks they'll be looking towards and sort of how different kinds of health professionals will be incorporated into those networks is sort of you know, the big open question that we have and we're exploring right now. I'd like to just bring up, bring up one more point though. I, you know, I think doctors do feel um, competitive um, around the retail clinics for good reason and I think that they're working for consumers in a lot of ways. But one of the th uh, things that I think we're not really paying much attention to is how much data we're losing um, in those visits that's not integrated with the overall health picture and health outcomes data of the patients we see in our more standard system. So I think that one of the ways to try to bring them in is to have more central um, individualized um, data information that can feed back to both systems about what's working and what isn't and how uh, what the role of each is in, um, in terms of convenience and quality. This may be something that obviously takes some time to play out because I know in Walgreens is putting all of this information in the cloud specifically so it can be accessed by individuals and given to their other uh, providers. So mm -hmm. as more systems take up that kind of approach, that may, that may make progress in its own right. I think I saw one other hand. Yes. Yeah, hi, uh, David Selden. I lead the uh, healthcare practice for Brunswick Group Strategic Communications, and so not surprisingly, I see a lot of this as a communications problem. Um, we talk about incentivizing better decisions and creating systems that allow for better decisions. One of the things that payers and providers and policymakers are all really bad at most of the time is talking to consumers and engaging them around these complex questions in ways that not only provide information, but provide the context and the explanation and the how-to that tells people not only how to make better decisions, but why they should care about the cost and, and the overall quality measures instead of just running to, my kid is sick, I'm going to get them the most expensive care possible because that's got to be the best. 
I'm curious what, I mean, I think the Walgreens is an interesting example, but what you all see out there that is working in that regard. Anybody want to take that on in terms of communication? I guess we don't look uh, for inspiration to how well people understand the Affordable Care Act, uh, given. Uh, <laughs> but are there are there better examples of things where people? The I think I think again this comes back to this point of, and any communications professional, yourself included, knows that being strategic about communications is one of the biggest issues. I think consumers are overloaded with information about healthcare and people trying to. I mean give you the top 10 things to do here and getting emails and the last thing I want is my inbox filled up by a bunch of health tips every single morning because that's I'm just going to delete those with all the other offers I get. So I think that working again coming back to this point of where like you said consumers will go towards what they see as maybe the most expensive or high quality traditional healthcare where they have established relationships is really I think the most important thing. That's where they want to communicate. They want to make that communication easier. So being strategic about how you can facilitate that type of communication, finding those types of sources, I think, is a big issue. And uh, um, there's a couple different ways, I think, that you can look at how you can come to a more consumer-oriented conception of quality and integrate that within the system. That's another discussion. So I think on one hand, it's strategic communications that matter the most. And trying to, again, integrate that within established relationships as much as possible. Um, you get into other issues of what are the technologies to enable very personalized communication like telemedicine and whatnot. That is another big, uh, big trend, I think, on that front. I noted this morning that uh, HHS now has on the healthcare.gov site a live chat function so that if you're filling out your form to enroll in health coverage, you can actually now have a live chat. That is a long way from the old way these uh, systems were run. So with that, uh, as we all know, parents always love all of their children totally equally. Uh, and I'm sure as authors of this report, you love all of these recommendations totally equally. But if I had to force you to pick one, one recommendation in the report that you think if we moved forward on, we could really move the needle in reinventing health care. And we'll leave reinventing health as an important objective, but a little bit beyond the scope of this, uh, of this report. So. Let me start with you, Bossett. Any one particular <coughs> aspect of the recommendations that uh, you think if we moved forward on it could make a big difference? Yeah, one of the things we talked about in the report was applying engineering principles to healthcare. And to me, I think this is a fundamental importance and something that gets overlooked. Um, I think on its surface, it can sound fairly mundane. Uh, but when you look at many problems in healthcare delivery, they're really engineering problems and not medical problems. And we don't have the right mix and skill sets inside of healthcare right now to address many of those issues. Um, so I think this is an important part of innovating in healthcare, particularly how the processes are structured and how care is delivered. Yeah, just give us one quick example of where bringing an engineer into the healthcare equation <laughs> could make a difference. Yeah, a good one is emergency room uh, overcrowding. Um, so we have this, this huge problem across the country where emergency rooms are filled to the brim, it's really a critical, enormous problem. And one of the reactions we have in the healthcare system is to build physically <coughs> larger emergency rooms. But when you look at research from areas like operations research, you know what people have found, Susan's very familiar with this work, um, is that the reason why emergency rooms are crowded tends to be because of the way we schedule ambulatory surgeries and the way we do discharges from hospitals. So that's a throughput problem. Right. So a lot of the problems we have in access to care in healthcare are throughput problems. Throughput problems are engineering problems. They're not physician problems. They're not hospital administrator problems. So you really want to get the best minds who think about, for instance, like optimization of supply chain for Walgreens to think about how do you optimize throughput of patients to enhance access to care, particularly when you have a fixed set of in infrastructure resources and 30 million, you know, potentially 30 million new people entering the system. Um, we really have to maximize, you know, what we can do with what we have. Um, so that's an example. You, know, you, you want to get people out of the overcrowded emergency yeah. room and up into the hospital bed, but you can't get them into the hospital bed if there are people still stuck in the hospital bed because they haven't been discharged. Yet. That's exactly that's, right. Yeah. People just board in emergency rooms all around the country and they just can't get a bed. 
right. So, Carol, a recommendation yeah. you cherish? Yeah, I go back to the information issue and how do we push on getting consumers the right amount of information and not just, you know, not so little information that they don't feel like they can choose a provider or choose a treatment, but not so much information that they default to choosing a provider that their neighbor recommended or the treatment that everyone gets. So I think getting that sweet spot of information, but also equipping consumers with the tools and skills they need to understand that information. That can start with health literacy in, in schools, teaching people the language of insurance, of deductibles, and and um, and, and co-pays. And we've seen part of that in these, these private exchanges that employers are, are sometimes going to, that educating consumers about how to choose a health plan is a big component of that. So I think the, to the extent that we can innovate and push on the information frontier, both uh, kind of in all those different aspects. Anjali, your, your pick for okay. favorite um, recommendation. I'm thinking similarly to Carol. Um, one of our recommendations is to encourage what we call school-based health literacy programs. But I think that was sort of, um, that idea came from how do we get a conversation that's really balanced between people who understand the healthcare system and healthcare and health and medical knowledge um, to consumers who really feel the effects of that. And you know what, a role I find myself in quite often is effectively a translator um, between what the doctor is saying and what my family member or friend is hearing. Uh, so I do think that there's a, a, a lot of room for improvement in terms of communication and um, a willingness on the part of the medical establishment to really let go of that secrecy of that private language that we speak um, in an effort to really get everybody engaged in, um, and school literacy programs would be one approach, but not, certainly not the only, and it's, uh, the problem is, does not, is not confined to only children, as we know, but all of us. And Brent, last word. Those are obviously popular recommendations. <laughs> so um, I'll speak a little bit to the principle of enhancing trust and communication between a patient and provider, and that, that's sufficiently broad to say that that can happen at the point of care, I think, which is really what sometimes the most basic fundamental notion of health literacy is about. Do you literally understand what is being prescribed? Do you understand what the diagnosis is? But it can also feature into issues that are much more, as I'll go into, trying to create some sort of, what are we trying to accomplish here with this type of communication? And to do that, you need to have two willing parties, I and mean, two parties that have capacity. And so obviously school-based health literacy, other opportunities in the community to have a much or a health coach to advise in sort of this process of getting up to date on what your treatment options are or what the navigating health navigators helping you navigate into different points of care but also again on the provider side and you've seen some really cool things I think going on in medical education today and the way that uh, future physicians and residents are being trained to be very sensitive to even you know they have their technologies which are their iPads that they're everybody wants them to use and that looks really cool but they're trying to get them to even put those away and look at someone in the eyes. And I think that that's a, that's a really important thing for not just communication, it's a very <laughs> baseline way to communicate with an individual, but trust as well, that you have empathy, that you're listening, and that there's an open line there. Well, what an appropriate point to end on, the importance of communication, because you, the four of you have done just a marvelous job of communicating some of the highlights of this report and, and putting them into context for the massive set of changes that we really need in healthcare uh, and in health generally to really achieve the triple aim of better care, better health, and lower cost. So join me in thanking these four for a terrific discussion. Um, I, I really like for a remarkable job of, of moderating and our wonderful authors. Uh, this is the opportunity to take a break. Um, <laughs> we are right on time, so if you could join me back here in 10 minutes, we'll have our second panel.
Kitchen.
receiver. Straightened his fingers. I remember because they went halfway between my wrist and my own. I expected a table also. Makes you feel kind of exposed, right? Makes you feel kind of exposed, right? Yes. Yes. Especially the elevated up here. Hopefully yeah. nobody can see anything. They should be seeing her. Okay. Because we're sort of both in this sort of shared situation space and come at it from a it's, different it's not on. angle, I think, but um, we did some early collaboration on to see if we could create similar measures across the three. And those are very bright lights. Demonstrations. But we're all to right. <laughs> You're on. Am I on? You are on. Can you hear me in the back? Are we on? All of us on. We are about to start the second panel. I'm inviting everyone out of the lobby into the room and into your seats. Thank you. And feel free to take the seats in the front. <coughs> okay. So we're back. This is the, this Innovation in Action panel. It's very exciting, and they are going to be, they are featured in our publication, which you should have on the chair. Feel free to take extra copies. Uh, the moderator is my dear friend, Andy Shin, who was actually at the uh, CMMI, uh, the Innovation Center, um, but he is still in the game, as I said before. Uh, he is now the Director of Health Policy and Life Science at ML Strategies, and I invite Andy up to the podium so that he can moderate this panel. Thank you, Fran Marie. Is this uh, microphone working? Yes. Just worried about the webcast, folks. Okay, it's working. Uh, I just want to thank uh, the Aspen Institute and Fran Marie uh, Kennedy in particular. For, for really doing something that's, I think, unique um, uh, in healthcare in this town in particular, which is being able to bridge uh, those high, lofty conversations and discussions and really connecting them down to the folks who are sitting right here before you, which are the on the ground, getting their hands dirty, actual innovators. And I think too often, uh, especially in this city, we, we, we think about uh, what could be and what the effects of policies are, but we have a rare opportunity to see before us um, what it actually means in communities uh, across uh, this country, from New York to Ohio, uh, all the way to California. And so I think this is just an, an amazing opportunity. So thank you to the Aspen Institute and uh, friend Mary Kennedy in particular for this opportunity. Uh, you know, at my current position uh, and my current organization, ML Strategies, we're often asked by companies uh, and coalitions, how do we engage with uh, with the government or other stakeholders to do what's right, we think, for, for patients and for consumers. And, and I think that uh, these group of innovators are, are the best example of how uh, an organization or a coalition uh, of the willing can come together and partner with the federal government, with state and local governments, and with private organizations and companies uh, to do what's right for patients and uh, aptly titled, uh, Reinvent the Healthcare System. And, and obviously I mean that in the broadest sense of, uh, of the word uh, as we discussed on the earlier panel. Uh, you know, when you think about Dr. Conway, uh, Dr. Conway's three ingredients to system transformation, uh, these leaders who sit here, I think, are, are, are very representative of that first pillar, which is the innovators, right? They're the ones who have the idea, who can put into practice the sort of innovation. The problem is they probably don't have the right incentives uh, and the system doesn't allow for them to do what they want to do, and then uh, that's where the CMS Innovation Center and the other work that uh, the, the department, as well as the other uh, collaborators and partners on the private sector side, are coming in to say, well, well, let's help you with that. Let's try to align the incentives for you. And then, based on that partnership, if it's a success, uh, we go to the third pillar of what Dr. Conway talked about this morning, which is spreading best practices. 
And it's at that point where you start to see real transformation and real change. And you get to that left-hand side of that slide that he showed you this morning with the arrows kind of pointing to that future system, the more coordinated system. Um, and I think that's the ultimate goal of uh, these particular organizations and, and the larger uh, in the innovators all around the country who are participating um, in, in this particular initiative. I think that uh, you know, if you look at Massachusetts on the eve of uh, October 1st enrollment date, uh, what comes to mind for me, having some, spent some time there, is that we can expect within a few years or less um, any of the inefficiencies in the healthcare system to be exacerbated. 30 million or less uh, new enrollees only accelerates the current fragmentation or inefficiencies that the system has, and it really is going to be up to uh, people like these who are going to either solve the problems or we're in for, uh, for a rough ride, to say the least. And so I think that uh, we're all looking to you uh, to succeed, uh, and, and you are more important than you may even realize, uh, I think, uh, for the ultimate success of, of where we go as a country in our healthcare. So, so with that, I, I do want to introduce uh, uh, the, our speakers today and, and, and let them kind of talk about, uh, from their perspective, what they're doing and, and how they see the system moving forward. So I'll start with my immediate left, which is Dr. Lynn Richardson. Uh, Dr. Richardson is a professor of emergency medicine, uh, professor of health evidence and policy, and vice chair for academic research and community programs of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and that's in New York City. Uh, her project is, is entitled the Geriatric Emergency Department Innovation uh, in Care Program, also known as Jetty Wise. Um, Dr. Richardson is a nationally recognized uh, health services researcher, and she is also the director of the Emergency uh, Medicine Research Career Development Program at Mount Sinai, which is an institutional training grant uh, to develop emergency medicine investigators. To Dr. Richardson's left is uh, Megan Christman uh, Schilke, who is the Chief Program Officer of the Bureau of Mental Health at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, where she oversees a $175 million contract in mental health services, or contracts in mental health services, throughout the city, including supportive housing, rehabilitation, uh, care coordination services, and the program that she's going to hear to talk about today, which is called Parachute New York uh, City, which is the program that provides new and innovative uh, services to individuals suffering from a psychiatric crisis. And I just realized the New Yorkers are sitting next to another, um, and then the two Ohio folks are sitting next to each other as well. Um, <laughs> to California. Yeah. So, uh, uh, to the left of Megan is Tim uh, Kodis, which is the, uh, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Wellbe, uh, which is the nation's first surgery management and optimization company. Uh, Wellbe's surgery decision program combines consumer-centric technology and sophisticated analytics to improve surgical outcomes. Prior to becoming the Chief Operating Officer of Wellbe, Tim was one of the original founders of Luminous, which is a, pi a pioneer in the growing consumer-driven healthcare industry, and I believe is, uh, is now part of uh, Wellbe. Uh, and then to Tim's left is uh, Tanika Price, uh, excuse me, is uh, Mary Hiller. Uh, Mary <laughs> is president of MedExpert International and executive director of Knowledge Engineering and Health Policy. Uh, Mary began her successful tenure as author of the world's largest syndicated medical column in 1990. Uh, in 2000, Mary uh, also founded uh, MedExpert International. Many of you have heard of them, the leading world source of current, unbiased, and accurate medical information and uh, she continues to serve as MedExpert's president today. Finally, uh, we have Tanika, uh, Tanika Price, who is a, an attorney. She's an attorney from Columbus, Ohio, who became interested in the impact of health disparities on infant mortality after giving birth to premature twins. Um, Ms. Price is currently the community health advocate at Moms to Be, which is uh, the name of her uh, innovation project, a healthy food and nutrition program sponsored by the Nationwide Children's Hospital and the Ohio State University, two of the leading organizations in the Columbus area. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, the presenters, uh, starting with Dr. Richardson, to, to go ahead and start to describe why they're here, what their project is briefly, and then we're really going to get into a great conversation, hopefully. Um, and I will talk much less, and uh, really hopefully the audience can, um, uh, can start to have some thought-provoking conversation. And I'll just ask, starting with Dr. Richardson, if you could try to frame your, uh, your synopsis, your summary of, of what you're doing uh, within the framework of kind of what Dr. Conway was, was speaking about this morning, which is 
we're worried about two problems, and one is quality and one is cost. He said uh, there's three ways you could do that, and I think that um, you all represent um, the ability to lower cost as one, and hopefully maintain, if not improve quality. I think in every one of your circumstances, that's really uh, how you are approaching your project. So if you could describe maybe what is the clinical or quality problem that you're, uh, that you're encountering, what is the cost problem, or how do you envision, or how do you calculate um, the cost problem, and then uh, how you're addressing those problems. So Dr. Richardson. Uh, thank you, Andy. So Jedi Wise, uh, which uh, the full name is Geriatric Emergency Department Innovations in Care through Workforce Informatics and Structural Enhancements. <laughs> and so if I didn't say anything else, that's, you know, that's the project. And what it, it, it really is, and it was funded by a Healthcare Innovation Award from CMS, for which we're very grateful, and it involves three sites. Um, each of which, where at each site, the emergency departments had already invested in structurally enhanced facilities uh, to develop something called a geriatric emergency department. And so Mount Sinai in New York City is the lead site, and our partners are St. Patterson's, uh, St. Joseph's in Patterson, New Jersey, and Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago. And what the Jedi Wise grant has allowed us to do is to really roll out a uh, really innovative uh, suite of care, changes in care and processes of care at each of these sites to improve the care for older adults in emergency departments. So what's the quality issue we're addressing? Well, like much of the healthcare system, emergency departments are really not ready uh, for the onslaught of older patients that are going to become uh, one of the uh, primary drivers of uh, utilization. Older adults actually are using emergency departments at a higher rate uh, than other age groups. And we are, we are not prepared uh, to care for older adults. In many ways, the emergency department is sort of the antithesis <coughs> of the kind of environment where older adults thrive. And so as we started to recognize uh, this and think about what is it we would have to do to change the way we deliver care so that it actually meets the needs of older adults, uh, we were informed by really some brilliant work by a young faculty member at uh, my institution named Eula Wong, who really helped to lay out for us what are the things we needed to change about the physical plant in the emergency department as well as the way we delivered care so that we could meet the needs of older adults. And so the Jedi Wise innovations include a number of things, including a lot of workforce training. Uh, we are re-educating the entire emergency department staff from attending physicians, residents, nurses, uh, social workers, uh, clerks, techs, uh, with uh, talking about how you communicate with older adults, what are the special issues, the perceptual issues. Uh, we've all, at Mount Sinai, we've run all of our staff through a module called Ageism and Communications 101 to really talk about some of the things mentioned in the earlier panel about how do we teach the emergency department staff to talk to our patients, older adults and their care caregivers in ways they can understand. Uh, we've also created new roles uh, in the emergency department with uh, things like a Jedi Wise pharmacist. Uh, one of the things about older adults is that they're on lots of medications. We looked at our over 65 um, uh, patients coming into the emergency department and the average number of medications they are taking is 11.5, the average number for over 65. And so the pharmacist actually meets with everyone over 65 who's on more than 10 medications and talks to the patient and their caregiver and goes through all of those medications and what they're for and how they're actually taking them and has it actually been filled. They'll call the pharmacy to find out what prescriptions have actually been filled. They'll call the primary care physician to suggest simplifications in the regimen. So taking the emergency department visit as an opportunity uh, to really uh, make some changes in the way that patient is being cared for. We also have a very strong transitional care management program that we based in the emergency department. And so this is looking at a transition which has really been ignored prior to this, which is from the emergency department to home. 
So as the bar is raised for who can actually be admitted to the hospital and not have it be denied by the payers when that uh, admission is reviewed, we're often faced with sending patients home saying, you don't quite meet the criteria to be sick enough to be in the hospital, goodbye and good luck. Now what JediWise has let us do is that now we can send those patients home and put the services around them that they need to succeed at home. And so we have a nurse practitioner who works in partnership with a social worker and they focus on those patients who are likely to be discharged from the emergency department to put into place all of the services that will actually improve <coughs> outcomes, to make sure that the prescription that's given in the emergency department gets filled, to make sure that they actually make a follow-up appointment with their primary care physician, that the transportation is arranged to get to the appointment with a primary care physician, and all the, all the things that happen that make the discharges fall apart that result in patients bouncing back to the emergency department and often being admitted to the hospital our transitional care management program is really uh, trying to sort out. We're also using informatics in very creative ways. We're doing routine screening of everyone over 65 for falls risk, for cognitive deficit, for functional disability, when it's indicated for depression screening. And we're using our electronic health records to walk all of the um, uh, providers through that so some of these things now are done at triage by our nurses on every patient over age 65 we're also able to capture the data out the back end to see whether or not um, doing these screenings are actually resulting in improved outcomes both safety outcomes and functional outcomes for patients we also have contracted with our regional health information organization uh, to use a health information exchange uh, application called event notifications so that if we have a patient who our JediWise transitional care NP has seen and sent home, if they present to any of the now, I believe it's 68 emergency departments that are part of our regional health information organization, we get a real-time message that that patient is in the emergency department so the NP can get on the phone and talk to the providers at that emergency department to tell them everything that was done at the previous emergency visit and also all of the plans we put in place uh, for them to get care at home so that that doesn't get repeated. And we have been able uh, to prevent, we believe, admissions that would have occurred at the other institution if we hadn't been able to provide that information to those emergency department providers. So it's a whole suite of things uh, woven together that I think has really helped us to see how you can align uh, what patients want, uh, what's good for the institution, and what's good for the payer. And so we have already started to see, we just finished our first uh, a year, uh, we have touched about 23,000 patients across the three sites. We are already seeing a decrease in hospital admissions for the over 65 uh, age group. We're seeing a decrease in readmissions in that group, a decrease in ICU admissions. We've seen a decrease in falls, and we've seen an increase in patient satisfaction scores on certain elements of the press gainy in the over 65 population. So we think we really you know, hit upon a project where we can improve quality, uh, improve health, while reducing costs. So we've, um, we're constantly looking at what we're doing and revising the innovations and, and getting the data to demonstrate what really works and how it can be scaled out to other institutions. So it's been challenging and exciting. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. I mean, every time we hear that, it, it sounds like this makes so much sense. <laughs> and, and, and usually the audience, you hear them nodding anytime you give examples about preventing falls. That, that sounds like a good idea in an emergency room. Um, Thank you. So, um, Megan. So, um, the clinical problem that we uh, attempted to address through our innovations grant in New York City was an almost complete lack of a continuum of care of crisis services for people in any kind of emotional or psychiatric crisis. Um, so, we decided to try to build one. And um, there, are, so we were not without any crisis services in New York, as I'm sure you can imagine. There were many throughout um, emergency departments 
of course, 911. We have had a loose network of mobile crisis services, which were really more urgent care, spread very thinly across a very large city and a very large population in need. Um, also, um, very much so, um, the kind of system that people avoided until it was so bad that the crisis was quite escalated and ultimately became the kind of situation that precipitated very long-term negative health outcomes. So we felt like there was a really large opportunity um, to leverage both some existing systems change happening in New York uh, through our own Medicaid reform efforts, both in the city and the state, um, and also to really take an opportunity to leverage a lot of the sort of more recent research and learning uh, in the behavioral health field, which we have had challenges in operationalizing throughout um, the mental health system um, to try to really put some of these things into practice. So Parachute NYC is our sort of umbrella term for this continuum of services. I'll briefly describe them and um, the real image that we wanted people to have and why it's called Parachute NYC is because it's a soft landing. The image of the parachute is about people coming to a place We'll talk about the, the place itself, but having the opportunity to go to a place that is not an emergency room, um, and hopefully going to a place that they want to go to a lot more than a hospital emergency room, such that they're doing so earlier in their illness and their crisis, so that we can actually work with them to help stabilize, to facilitate recovery. We want to see crisis as an opportunity for engagement. Um, we want to see crisis as an opportunity to help connect people to the types of resources, social service, health, um, vocational. Um, we also want to see our services as non, it's a disruptive innovation in, in, the, in the way that my colleagues spoke about it earlier, um, but non-disruptive to the lives of the individuals who it was trying to, to help and, and support. So um, a, a stay, an, an involuntary uh, stay in a hospital is a very disruptive event in any individual's life, as I'm sure many of you know. I don't have to tell this group that, but um, while hospitals can be incredibly um, positive places and can do wonderful things for the health care of the individuals they're serving, for someone who's in psychiatric crisis, it is not a supportive and therapeutic environment that facilitates their recovery. Um, for the most part, we believe it can be prevented, um, that people do not need to go to the emergency department for a psychiatric crisis if we can, in fact, help anticipate them, help them plan. Um, so the parachute continuum of services is about a mobile treatment team, um, responds less than 24 hours to an individual who is at risk of crisis. Um, if need be, they're uh, taken to or referred to a respite center, crisis respite, um, and that center is a, is a temporary uh, place for them to stay. It's, they're the most beautiful mental health programs you'll ever see. I highly encourage you, if you come to New York, to please come visit. We'll give you a tour. Um, but if you, there's also images on our website. I can share lots of information with folks, but they're beautiful. We created them to be home-like environments that are supportive, that are warm, that help people maintain the connections with their lives. You don't have to give up your job. You don't have to give up your apartment. You don't have to lose all of those things that help you in your recovery, which unfortunately many people do when they experience that psychiatric crisis. And in particular, um, not only uh, are we focusing on it, but it's a very important focus of ours to really focus on first episode psych psychiatric breaks that people are having because they are the really the opportunity, young adults who are first going through that psychotic episode, if we can possibly engage them uh, and, and connect them to the supports that they need and to the services they need, the ability to prevent that terrible, chronic, long-term trajectory of patienthood and um, negative outcomes and ho um, homelessness and jail and all of the terrible things that we see happen to people because unfortunately when you have a psychiatric break and you um, get very ill in our system and don't get help until you're in a very deep crisis, you lose all of those things and, and frequently end up in this downward spiral that lands you in poverty and all these other social implications that I'm glad to have heard other people mention. So we have our mobile treatment team, we have our crisis respite, we also have a support line, um, and I would add that a lot of the components of this are deeply based on a couple of um, really leading edge practices that we identified. We did a, you know, a really worldwide survey of leading edge practices and mental health intervention for people with psychosis, and including Europe, and we brought actually some of the identified experts um, from Sweden and from Germany here to New York to help us build this system and train 
the people in New York City. And so there's a need adapted treatment model. And I won't go into all the details, obviously, of this, but we're happy to share information about our research, the literature, and the, and the models. Um, but also intentional peer support, which is a deeply um, peer-based <coughs> intervention and model that we employ throughout the system. Um, the goal was for the majority of the people employed to, support, to staff these services are people with lived experience in the mental health system. Um, and so that in and of itself is also an, uh, an intervention for many people um, to help facilitate their continued recovery. Uh, and I think, um, you know, we will talk a lot about, I think, the barriers and such, but I will say that we have successfully now implemented these services. Today, we open in the Bronx. They're up, my staff are up there doing the, the big opening ceremony, so that's really exciting. And we've opened in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Um, so by, the, by March, we'll be citywide. Um, and we will be um, continuing to expand, hopefully, and talk about scalability and the other issues. But, um, but that's the continuum that we're implementing in New York. Um, so, so Tim um, is going to talk about Welby, and I think, I might be wrong about this, but I think Welby is the largest, or, the, or in terms of the geographically speaking, the largest um, awardee in, in, the, in, the, in the first round. Um, you're in how many states? Uh, really, just in Ohio. Oh, just Ohio. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, I thought you were. <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm scaling ahead for you. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and I, you know, prior to these conversations, I certainly thought that we had a, a complex problem that we were going after. Now I realize we probably have the simplest problem that we've been dealing with. <laughs> um, we're focused on on really one thing. Um, <laughs> what we call preference-sensitive surgery. And preference-sensitive surgery is um, procedures that people have all the time where they, have a uh, they, where they can actually make a decision. So there's usually three or more different options that they can decide upon. Um, preference-sensitive surgery is about, uh, in most cases, 30% of the healthcare dollars. So when you're talking about what, what, who's spending what. Um, and in Ohio, in the demonstration, we, um, we, we thought about, all right, we're, we, our idea here was to start working in the senior population with uh, Medicare Advantage and with fever service. Um, because in this population, uh, over one in three will have a preference sensitive surgery each and every year. Um, and the issues in a senior population around risks and benefits associated to preference sensitive surgery are significant. Um, so even when it's necessary, there are still risks that may um, disqualify somebody uh, from having a preference sensitive surgery. Um, we go about it in a really, really basic, simple way. Um, our, our bias, our entire team's bias is uh, intervening at the consumer level. So we always believe and think that these systems are incredibly complicated, but if we could activate the consumer um, to think about the problem in a very different way, um, that we can actually get them to do some things that are just slightly different. Um, so we developed a program. It's a cur curriculum-based program. Uh, it's literacy-based. It is uh, not complicated. It is, you know, based on a, a sixth grade uh, reading level. So we're not talking about having to have seniors understand real complex medical problems. Um, our design is a randomized control group design. So we've taken the state of Ohio. We've uh, we um, partnered with. Uh, Anthem of Ohio for the Med Advantage portion, and then we have partnered obviously with CMS for the fee-for-service portion. We split both of those groups um, into randomized groups, and we have an intervention group and a control group. Um, we are completely committed to actually, you know, being able to demonstrate that that this intervention truly works. Um, we were able to start, again, it's, it's a fairly easy thing to do. The, the biggest barrier is getting seniors to know that a resource exists. The nice thing about surgery as a category is that there's a level of anxiety that people have about surgery, <coughs> trepidation, and, and anxiety and trepidation is a strong motivator. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's not strong enough. We also use consumer incentives. Uh, we have a very small consumer incentive, about $25, for seniors that go through the program. Um, and with that, so we're, we're one year into it, we literally started the day our operational plan um, was approved. And we have 6,000 participants, uh, over 6,000 today, participants that have gone through the program. Um, 
We are seeing some phenomenal results. Uh, the results, we, we obviously, because we have this randomized control group, um, we're seeing uh, um, almost a five per thousand uh, rate of reduction in, in surgery rates uh, of five per thousand on a monthly basis. We're seeing uh, a reducing trend in, in readmissions um, because again, what we're focused on are teaching people how to interact with all the healthcare providers that they're going to interact with in terms of making these decisions. Um, how to have a, a conversation. We literally do role plays uh, programmatically uh, through the uh, process. Um, and we deliver the program, uh, one of the, it, commercially we've always delivered the program online, so it's been an online uh, program. In the Medicare space, we were very concerned uh, about all the questions people have about seniors. Will they engage in li online? Frankly, will they do anything different? Uh, can they play a different role with, a, with their physician? Because seniors have a very traditionalist view about the patient-physician relationship. And, and we were really concerned that while the commercial population and the younger generation don't think like that at all, um, the seniors, were they really going to be able to make that shift? And so our biggest concerns up front were, could they engage? Uh, would they engage? Uh, and then would they do something different? Uh, about 60% of the participants today are using, um, are, are going through a program online, which shocked us. Um, 40, well, 39% uh, use the program uh, via a paper booklet, uh, where they go through the program and then we follow up with them. And then about 1%, can we give them the option to do all three, 1% actually uh, will at, have a, one of our um, nurses actually go through the program and deliver it over the phone. Um, so it's mostly being delivered online, uh, followed with paper booklet. Um, you know, I think the best way to describe it, uh, the, the program's influence is to, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, a, a participant actually called unsolicited and uh, gave us this feedback about the program, and I just want you to share it. I want to share it very quickly because I think it really, she articulates extremely well what this was all about for her. Quality customer service. Hey, how can I help you? Can you just hear this? Yes, my name is and you sent me all the steps of your uh, wealthy uh, information. And okay. I, just was, I just wanted to call and thank you so very much because I was going to have a knee replacement and I didn't think it on a second opinion. And then when I called you and got all this information, it definitely made me decide to have one, a second opinion. And when the doctor, the second doctor checked my legs, he said, I can give you a knee replacement, but you won't have a foot. I have circulation problems in my feet and legs, so I have to have that taken care of. And I just wanted, and I read all of your literature that you sent me, and I want to thank you so much. Wow. Excellent. Oops, sorry. You don't need to hear it. <laughs> See, in my car, I just rotated over and over and over. <laughs> anyway. Um, Again, complex problem. Here's a person who really probably needs surgery, but really shouldn't have surgery until these other issues, comorbidity issues, are taken care of. That's what we do. That's what we're all about. Tim, uh, thank you. That was, uh, it doesn't get more real than that, I think. Um, thank you for that. And, and Mary, I think I was, I was jumping the gun, and I think you are the most uh, ubiquitous uh, innovation award project, at least geographically speaking. Yeah. Well, thank you, Andy, and thank you to the Aspen Institute, and especially thank you uh, to CMS and the Innovation Project. We are a uh, grant winner in the space of shared decision making. Um, currently, after year one, we're engaging about 130,000 people and having great results. And um, I think to understand, because shared decision systems, information decisions, sort of carries an interesting uh, uh, undefined real process. So one of the best ways to, to share why we're here in, is sort of a personal journey. I was a, a leukemia researcher at Stanford in the 70s. If it came to our lab or one other lab in the world and you had AML, you were able to get into first remission. We were upset that a lot of people around the world just weren't able to do that. And so we published feverishly in all the main journals, and it wasn't getting disseminated. Well, in that era, at that point, um, the error rate in healthcare was about 25%. The 
Uh, healthcare accounted for about 14% of the GDP. The doubling of information at that point was, we think about 14, you know, 14 years. So advance to now and compare it, the doubling of information is now less than five years, our GDP 19%. So what we did after the 70s is saying, how can we solve this? How can we challenge ourselves? We have brilliant people all over the world discovering amazing information. But why should it take what it takes right now, 7 to 17 years, to get it to the point of care? So the nugget that we chose to tackle is really information. In the 80s, we went on, uh, you may know, uh, short-lived Meissen Project at Stanford. In the 90s, we started, took a, a, a little sturdier aim at this. So from 1993 to 1997, we did a longitudinal study of 200,000 people, trying to understand what do patients need. And the panel before was really right on in terms of, we were addressing what is this thing called consumerism? What is education? What do people need? The error rate was jumping from 25% to now Rand and all, you know, think the error rate's 46, 50%. So we put the group together and we saw, aha, there's really four buckets of, of times or sections when patients want information. Diagnostic phase, just, di just diagnosed, treatment, and living with condition. But what really perplexed us and rocked us on our heels, yes, 45% of the people ask for help for information within the 24 to 48 hours after just being diagnosed. But what was astonishing to us, they make up their mind on severe cases in 24 to 48 hours. So we thought, well, what are we going to do now? So we started um, trying to analyze this subject. So from 97, 98, 99, we said it was sort of the advent of AI, artificial intelligence. We worked with Peter Solovitz at MIT. He was one of the founders of it. And Phil Lee and John Rother was already on board. He has now, hence, left us here. But uh, in Philly, but we said, you know, how do we build um, hooks into this world of clinical knowledge? Because we work with um, AHRQ has brilliant NGC, uh, the VA hospital has all their guidelines. But when we analyze those guidelines, they do take four to eight hundred hours to establish. But the, they flow down river in terms of staling, and um, very often they're they're not current, or they just stale. So we, we started building a system. And the problem was we successfully built it in a manual AI using expert systems, fuzzy logic and whatnot, but it took four to 800 hours manually. Well, what patient is going to pay for four, to, or, or health delivery system will pay for four to 800 hours of research? And further, we just proved to ourselves a couple of years earlier that a patient will make up their mind in the first day. So we engineered that. We moved to Champaign-Urbana, home of supercomputing with Larry Smarr and uh, NCSA, National Center <coughs> for Supercomputing Applications, where the concept of space is free had to be prominent. And we took the four to 800 hours down to four to eight minutes. What this meant was we figured out how to have a higher level of starting point. We even tested it in retro back to the leukemia days and said if we were a, if we had been diagnosed with AML in, in 1976, could we have found the organizations or institutions that had a protocol that allowed you to go into first remission? And we, we could. So then in 2000, we said, we need to figure out how to build this out. All we had at that point was the golden nugget of knowledge. And we said, well, you know, how do we move it forward? So we started a company um, called MedExpert. And fortuitously, in around 2004, uh, we landed a organization that had 130,000 lives. But the best part is they were a Taft-Hartley organization. They had about 25,000 Medicare participants in that organization. They made uh, benefit decisions on a three-year cycle. So we were, um, it, and we were the only change they had made from the previous year. 90 plus percent of their population was the same. We engaged them with how we now deliver this. Um, on any given day, we can produce 220 million different reports that cover 22, 000, all 22,000 medical conditions in all phases and whatnot. But if you permeate all that math, it's like 220 million. 
So we deliver those via a staff of physician and information coordinators by phone supported electronically. But if someone can't read or write or wants to have an email, there is no time limit to how long our physicians spend on the phone. So that was addressing, we, are, we have gone from a very expensive setting to we keep our costs down. So with this process, what we were able to have is a reduction year one of 17%. Year two, 17%. Then we started going, this is maybe too good to be true. So um, after now seven years, their health care costs for the same population have not gone up a single dollar. And that was pretty astonishing. So then we said, well, where are these changes coming from? Because when we started, all we wanted to do was believe the tenant of delivering current, unbiased, accurate information. Um, at that point, people said, well, you know, there's, if you develop quality, if you deliver quality costs, you have to address costs. And we said, we're going to play the naive route. We're going to assume that if I give a patient current and biased accurate information, that you're not going to have two surgeries if one would have been right. You're not going to be on 11.3 meds if three is appropriate. You're not going to go to the doctor. So we thought, well, what about the value proposition? Because we have engineered how to do all the values also. So some of the costs are coming from the fact that, and this is now bearing out with the Medicare population, when they engage with us, and roughly 10% will engage into episodes, but that 10% on any given year accounts through claims analysis of about 39 to 45% of all the costs. 9.5% of the time, they have a reduction in office visits. Um, across all that we do, 14.4% reduction in ER visits. And it is actually not even very fancy. If you know that someone's going to go, talk to them on Monday morning. Don't wait till you know, if you see a repeat pattern and you can predict the behavior that someone tends to go, start early and get them into a, a, a normal process. Um, Reoperation rates, recidivism are also down. The other thing that we just discovered about a year and a half ago when we started tracking is we started taking a look at all the episodes where we deal with people on procedures. And we actually made ourselves a little bit nervous because 44% of the people who we had a full medical episode, meaning they got the information, they went over it with our physicians, and they went, you know, were managed by our information coordinators as often as it takes, um, either postponed or canceled it. All we could do was prove that they didn't do anything for 240 days. So we started thinking, ay, 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 are we just becoming some, you know, surrogate for denial of care or denial of access to care? So then we um, looked and broke it down by type and did the medical research in the literature and found, no, you know, X percent of back surgeries are considered unnecessary. It mimicked ours, our rates. So then we started feeling much more comfortable that you can trust patients with this information. You don't need a financial bias. Um, and, you know, the carrot stick approach never hurts. But we thought, well, let's be Puritans on this and see if you need it. But we found that we don't. In our population, 99% of the people that use us once will use us again. We thought, do we just have a particularly sick population? But it's not. What happens is, and what the earlier panel talked about was, the first time someone raises their hand for help, it's usually because they're in a disease state. But once they figure out there's a lot of decisions to make, they kind of shift down the severity. So for instance, starting um, Safeway, actually, we run every one of their programs for their carrot stick you know, things across the country. We run all the healthy measures across the country. It's the same process. It's just the subject may not be hip replacement surgery. The subject may be hypertension. Or the subject may be, gee, how do I exercise better? But the formula for how do you get to the answers is actually identical. It's just the severity of the case is down. So we're looking forward um, to continuing. We've uh, done a lot of, I, and I think Andy's going to talk about scaling and whatnot on the, uh, you know, on the other side. But we're looking forward to moving forward and seeing these reductions and working with the entire industry because we all we do is focus on information, and that's that's our sweet spot, and that's all, you know that's where we want to stay. Thank you. And, and I'll just say 
break in here to say that we did not coordinate with Susan's first panel at all yet. You know, <laughs> I think it's the last question when she said, what, what are the principles you want to take away from this? You know, as I said, engineering, information, literacy, communication. Uh, I think you're already seeing that kind of covered on this panel, so I guess I guess the job is done. Yeah. <laughs> I'll back up. Um, started. And, and, and we've started to really started. tackle, I think, social determinants of health too, which is something that I think Tanika, you know, will talk about as well mm -hmm. uh, within her project. So, please. Thank you. I'm Tanika Price for Moms to Be. I work with an extraordinary group in Columbus, Ohio. A lot of you already know Dr. Gabby who's our founder and we call her our fearless leader because we've actually had shootings at two of our locations and mm -hmm. Dr. Gabby has just been, well, let's go outside and see what's going on, you know, <laughs> let's, and we're like, no, we're not going outside. So we call her our fearless leader. Um, she really models for us what it is to take care of people. Um, Twinkle French Shockey is our program director and she's also fabulous, really knows how to deal with people in poverty. She's taught me so much in two years that I've been there. We also have a, uh, recently we've added a registered dietitian, um, Carmen Clutter, and she actually goes over with the moms, you know, their meals every week and what they should be eating during pregnancy. And then we have two family advocates that work directly with the moms every week. Um, that's Katie Richardson and Jamie Free. So I just wanted to start by introducing our team to you. They are wonderful, <coughs> fabulous. I'm the community health educator. And what that means is that I really take um, my experience as being a mom of six um, and also being an attorney, um, going through education. And I try to break things down for the moms. A lot of what we've already talked about. Um, I think that like one of the panelists said earlier, pregnancy is a unique uh, entryway to looking at health. And so we really have a, a really great opportunity to educate people on their bodies and how their systems work, things that um, are not being done, unfortunately, because of the caseloads and things like that that doctors have when they see pregnant women. So Moms to Be is a healthy uh, food and nutrition program, as most of you already know, that um, we're entering our third year. Um, we exist in the community. So our first site is in what's called Wyland Park. That is where infant mortality was the highest in Columbus, Ohio. Um, we serve primarily African-American women because it is African-American babies, unfortunately, that are dying <coughs> at almost three times the number of white babies. Um, in Columbus, Ohio, particularly in Franklin County, we have a higher infant mortality rate than in New York City, no offense, or <laughs> Chicago which is really hard for us to deal with there in Ohio because we have Ohio State, we have nationwide children, we think we have access, we think that you know, things are equal and, and um, you know, it's not the South as my grandma would say. So why are we having these problems with this disparity? Um, and that's kind of what got me interested as being a law school grad, I hadn't passed the bar yet when I had my twins, but I was a law school grad, I thought I was smart, right? <laughs> so when I started to go into preterm labor at 21 weeks, I did not understand what was happening. I'd had three healthy pregnancies prior to that. No, you know, obvious signs that I would go into preterm labor, yet it was happening to me. I was the statistic. And I became determined to figure out why that statistic exists. And I also found out on the flip side that African American women were more likely to die in childbirth than white women. They're more likely to have gestational diabetes. They're more likely to have hypertension. All of these things, cancer, you name it. Why, why, why? So that's sort of my larger mission. Um, from a clinical perspective, what we do is we are trying to deal with the social determinants of health. So we are trying to look at the pregnancy and not just look at the baby or the mom, but look at the holistic picture of what type of stressors are weighing on this mom that could impact her to have a premature delivery. I don't know if you know, but premature delivery is the number one cause of infant mortality. So when we're looking at what we can do to help babies live, the biggest thing we can do is keep that baby <laughs> in the womb for up to 40 weeks. The closer we can get to 40 weeks, usually the better the outcome. We started with, I brought a lot of props, um, this little thing here, preventing infant mortality in Ohio. This was a task force report because of some of the work that I'd done about telling my stories about my twins. I was um, asked to be on this panel for governor, our former governor, Ted Strickland. This is where I originally um, met Dr. Gabby and a lot of other prominent people in Columbus were on this. But we made this nice booklet and everybody packed up to go home. And Dr. Gabby said, wait, 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 we have to do something. 
It's not enough that we have all these recommendations. It's not enough that we found all this disparity and that we found African-American babies are dying, particularly in these zip codes. What are we going to do? And everybody was like, uh, you know, went back to their practices. Dr. Gabby originally wanted to do a spa day. Darn, wish I'd have been there for that boat. Uh, where we would do a weekly spa day with pregnant women. And we would, you know, give them, get their nails done, their feet done, their hair done, because she was thinking of a way to reduce stress. That, as you could probably imagine, was not too cost effective. <laughs> so the team decided to do healthy food and nutrition, specifically cooking for moms and then teaching moms about healthy food. Because most of you also know that we have an, a, an epidemic of obesity amongst African American women. And obesity does play a role in some of the complications that women go through in pregnancy. So we thought if we could teach healthy food and nutrition, look at this, we're looking at the life course model, right? So imagine the impact that we can have on the unborn child if we can get the mother to increase their fruits and vegetables, if we can get the mother to drink more water, if we can get the mother to put down the soda, which is a big thing in moms-to-be, right? We are actually impacting the life of the unborn child. We're starting their life course perspective at some place that they wouldn't be had it not been for their interaction with moms-to-be. So this wasn't just about the nine months of pregnancy. This is really about looking at life. We expect to see changes in two and three generations because of the impact that we've had in moms-to-be. So back to the beginning, Dr. Gabby thought we'll do a 10-week cooking session. And she thought we'd be lucky to hold on to women for 10 weeks. Guess what happened three years later? We have moms we cannot get rid of. <laughs> they are there every single Wednesday. We have moms that go to job interviews and say, I could take this job, but I really need to go to Moms to Be Wednesdays. And we're like, no, don't say that. Get the job, right? We have become a family. We have become a support system. Um, we have moms that even though we talk about birth control and we actually do a reproductive birth plan, reproductive health plan, where we try to empower women to choose what birth control they're going to be on after they have their babies. But even with all of that, we have one mom who's on her third baby in moms-to-be. So if we've been there three years, you can do the math, right? So we have become part of that family, part of that infrastructure, part of the support system. We have a mom that had eight kids. She was having her eighth baby. And when we went to visit her in the hospital, when she started having problems, she had a tape note, and it said, in case of emergency, call, not her mom, not her dad, not her siblings. It said Katie, Carmen, Tanika, and Twinkle. Those were her emergency contacts, and I get choked up every time I think of it. We have become people's support systems. One thing that we do when you come down the stairs to the basement, I wish I could just take you all to moms to be, we really take off our hats. I'm not an attorney down there. Dr. Gabby's not a doctor. Our social workers aren't social workers. We really are just people there to celebrate and service the mom. All the stuff the panelists talked about earlier, we do the eye contact, we do the physical touch, the, oh, we are such big huggers. I sometimes forget when I leave and I start hugging random people and they're like, oh, sorry, I'm still in moms to be mode. You know, we really are all about showering that love. And then what we do is through a grant we have with MedTap, we bring on first-year medical students, second-year medical students, third-year medical students, uh, nurses in training. We bring all those people down there where we are so that they're able to work with people in poverty and see them as real people. Because I had three kids, and I don't remember feeling like a person when I was going through the medical process. We talked about this some earlier. Uh, you touched on the young people not wanting to go to primary care physician. And this is no, doctors are doing the best they can. What we do is try to educate them to the doctor's low. We try to educate them to what stressors the doctor have on there. So they're more understanding of why they only have five minutes with the doctor or seven minutes with the doctor. And we try to get them to know their numbers. What's your blood pressure? What is your diabetes number? So that they're empowered to take care of themselves, not just during pregnancy, but after pregnancy. Because if you have gestational diabetes, you have an increased chance for having diabetes after your baby is born. These are the kind of things that we teach our women. So if you have an increased risk for diabetes, you need to start eating like you have diabetes in order to prevent it. That's what I learned from my mom being diabetic. So the things that you know, doctors don't have time to maybe teach the patient, we are there to sort of supplement that. And we also do a checklist so they know when they go into their prenatal exam to ask certain questions. You know, what are my risks for getting a C-section? 
What would I do if I went into pre premature labor? Where would my babies be cared for? My best story to tell you is that we had a woman who was pregnant with triplets and no, she did not use any fertility drugs, okay? It's all natural. She had two children at home. Uh, her husband was out of work. She had a part-time job. We were there to support her. Our biggest thing was how early would she have the twins, the triplets, how early? And what would we be able to do to make sure that they were healthy when they came? Well, because of the support that they got, and it wasn't just social, emotional support. I mean, people actually physically helped them. People donated money to them, donated things for the triplets. She was able to keep the triplets 37 weeks. We defied all the odds in that case. And the social determinants of health did not indicate for her that she would have made it that long. She defied the odds. So those are the kind of things that we're able to do at moms to be and we really appreciate the support to continue that. Uh, thank you so much, Ratika, for that. Um, we have about 20 minutes, so I'm just going to get straight to the questions. And I'll just lead off the questions as you're formulating your own. Um, and we'll cut straight to the chase. Everyone's wondering, sounds great, sounds like it can lower costs, improve quality. Why aren't you doing this in every community, in my community, um, and when can you start? So uh, maybe, uh, Tink, if we'll just let you start it off. Um, what are your biggest barriers to scale right now? Well, I think for us, the biggest barrier to scale is having people who understand poverty, who understand health care disparities, <laughs> who understand that racism is still real and still impacting moms, um, people that understand that this is about the holistic person that we can't piecemeal healthcare anymore. We can't just look at pregnancy. We can't just look at diabetes or high blood pressure or hypertension. We have to look at, does this person have a safe place to live? Does this person have transportation to get back and forth? Does this person have childcare where they can leave their children with someone they trust in order to go focus when they're at the doctor's office, right? Because I used to take my kids to doctor's appointments. You can't focus. So these are all the kinds of things we need people that understand this, that come from, and I think you said something great. If we have more people who came out of this situation that could serve, I think that also will make a big impact. Um, so we're trying to cultivate more peer relations, people who could take over what I'm doing, people who could take over what Twinkle is doing, what Dr. Gabby's doing, that come from poverty, that understand poverty. Um, we have saved money, let me tell you the statistics. Preterm births are $46,004, full-term births are $3,859. That's a savings of about $42,145. So moms to be, since our inception, has saved about 295,000 when compared just in Wyland Park to that low birth rate of 14.6 percent. That's a really high low birth rate. So there is a cost savings there if we can get more people to buy into that. But we don't want people to sort of do top downs. We don't want people to come in and say, "Hey, you people, this is how you guys can get healthy." Why don't you eat more apples, right? It's so easy. We don't want that kind of approach. We want people to actually get in to the culture, to understand the dynamics of the culture, to understand why this type of food is not appealing to this culture, or why we don't talk about this in this culture, why you know soul food is so important to our culture. It's very hard to give up. So we do healthy soul food. We don't do fried chicken. We do baked fried chicken with pretzels. You should try it, look it up on the internet. It's really good. <laughs> we modify, we do greens with turkey instead of ham hocks. So we make those kind of changes that are culturally appropriate and I believe that's why people come back. But if you don't understand the culture and you're not willing to learn the culture, then we're gonna have more programs that aren't effective. Thank you. And Mary, it sounds like you already have a lot, you're already working with employers, it sounds mm -hmm. like, and obviously Medicare. Um, uh, what, what are your barriers to scale, whether it be policy or operational? Well, in the last three years, we actually did a very, very deep dive to be able to plan for um, helping 150 million lives. So we did a, a huge database conversion that we successfully changed. Um, further, we did a very large phone and communication system conversion so we can uh, handle three million calls every four hours. Um, are prepared to be able to do that. But so our, uh, the barrier to, s to scaling at this point, because that has been our focus from day one, um, is to get the green light to scale. But in listening to Tanika and all the other wonderful people, I mean, we use um, part of our automated system um, pings Durline. 
um, which I think still has 67,000 organizations. But when we help people, we find local boots on the ground solutions for them. Um, I don't know how we would tap into your organization. So if we happen to be helping someone there, mm -hmm. it would be maybe some type of, I mean, I know, you know there are registries and whatnot, but we can automatically ping them so that when we are working with someone, part of the content on that report will say, here's some solutions for you. Mm -hmm. So it would be the rapid identification of great programs that would help enrich it. When we started this years ago, I used to see something like yoga or swim lessons and go, well, we're in medicine, we're not in yoga. <laughs> well, with a little maturity, I realized if you have a senior citizen and they, they're not exercising and they're not going to PT or something of that sort, we now see it as a, a win when we can have people signed up and we do the signing up and the transportation and the sneaker groups and the yoga in order to find those solutions, but we spend a tremendous amount of money on seeking local solutions. So that is something that, you know, the medical stuff we've got wired because there's enough discipline in healthcare in the medical clinical knowledge side to be able to do that, but a little less discipline in the really good homegrown, not homegrown, but boots on the ground near home solutions. Really interesting, thank you. Uh, Tim. Um, our intervention really is a, it's a technology play, so the biggest challenge we have is just patient awareness and activation. So we need to make sure that people know that it's there and how to get to it. Um, and so we spend a lot of time on that. I mean, we, 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 we model, at any given time, we've been, we, we test little pieces, everything from a postcard to a phone call to see what, what engages people and what uh, makes them aware that the resource is there. Much like all the other programs that you'll hear, once a patient activates, they honestly don't go backwards. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. If you can teach them basic skills, it's, it's like, a, you know, in my generation, I remember the, the, uh, there were several things, you know, the, the learning to walk across, uh, you know, a street. It was, uh, what was it, stop, look, and... Listen. listen, yeah. Stop, look, and listen, right? Um, and I, you know, I vividly remember the commercials of the crying Indian trying to teach me not to litter. And I, you know, there are pieces it, and it, there are things that happen that, you know, once implanted on you, you don't go back. Uh, when you make the shift from understanding the difference between a generic and a brand, and it's, again, it's not just cost, but the minute you get somebody understanding that they need to ask that question every time, they ask the question every time. So our biggest challenge is just getting that person the first time. So I'd say our biggest barriers are um, diversion is scary to people. People trust and have come to rely on the hospital system to manage risk for them in healthcare and in especially in um, very intense situations of crisis and need and when there are issues raised of safety and suicidality and um, really intense symptoms that are experienced by people in, in psychiatric crisis. So learn, teaching people um, consumer education is an enormous piece. First of all, just this is a game changer. This is so completely different what we're doing. Offering someone a warm place to stay that's not a hospital that has peer support where someone will talk through your choices with you um, is so different than what we currently have that there's a big education gap risk management, the healthcare system is afraid to refer people because they don't know what it is and they don't trust it yet. And they don't trust that they can really manage these intense crises. And so we are working a lot with provider education. We bring providers, emergency room doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists into the respite and we teach them what it is and we have them talk directly with people who have sort of lived in it and learned uh, to learn from them that you can in fact manage a crisis without an emergency room. And that's the, the big numbers of the cost saving there is that a 14 day stay in a hospital is $10,000 more expensive per person than a 14 day stay in our respite. So you can see the immediate impact um, if we can really help educate people. I would say the other thing is that people don't, the, the enormous stigma of psychiatric issues are, are um, being addressed slowly but we really are trying to use one of the key interventions that, that the literature and the research does work, which is about being planful about how you manage your illness. I think the earlier plan panel mentioned planning and thinking people proactively planning and thinking about their future healthcare needs. 
once someone has been diagnosed with a psychiatric illness, um, unfortunately, they have to have the conversation that this is likely to happen again to you. You will go through a period, even if you go through a period of stability. People don't want to think about that. They don't want to make those plans, and I don't blame them. And I don't, for you know, friends and family of mine who have lived through that, I know how painful that is. But the, but truly, if you know, you've been diagnosed with schizophrenia. I, you know, one of our, our recent respite um, guests who finally was able to, um, when she was slowly uh, encouraged by a, a friend of hers to come to our respite, to talk with people who had lived through what she had lived through, they, um, they sort of got Nancy to say, I don't want to admit that I have a mental illness. I'm afraid of what that means for my life and for my family and for my job. But once she was able to talk through it with someone else who had, was you know, obviously successful in living in the community, she was able to acknowledge that engagement. She was able to make a plan for her future illness. She was able to tell her family, if this happens to me again, I want to go here. I want to go to this respite and not to the hospital. These are the things I want to happen. So I think helping people to get there, it's a long process, but when we do it, it can have an enormous impact. So those are the, some of the, and the last thing is just payer innovation. We, I think, sometimes point at insurance companies, we meaning local government, meaning the provider system, et cetera, point at the payers as the bad guys in this equation or not being innovative enough or not keeping up with us or not doing what they need to do on their end of the bargain. But I think we really need to help them be creative and nimble in how they think about paying for services. We're talking to a lot of um, managed care companies in New York about how they might buy this service in the future and so helping them think through more nimble and more responsive ways to pay for services that really need to be customized to the individual that need to be titrated over time six visits in one month maybe not a visit next month maybe three visits i mean that's not how we have supported it's not how our payer systems are set up so we can't just tell them we'll figure it out we have to work with them on how to do that and help them be innovative too please doctor so interestingly, I, I think some of our major challenges are very similar to the things that Tamika spoke about, and it's really about getting people to understand what we're trying to do. And so, uh, you know, the, the provider attitudes, and I, and I have to say probably the, the, the biggest cohort in this that are problematic are the physicians, speaking as a physician, of really getting them to change their ideas about what is their job, and, and, and you spoke about this before, and especially for emergency physicians, to, to have them tune into something um, other than uh, life-threatening uh, acute emergencies as being part of the service they're providing. And so we had to put a lot of things in front of them, and I think we've been successful at each of the three sites where we're rolling out JediWise We've developed some tools, we've developed um, educational modules, but, but the biggest barrier, I think, to scaling this is to get buy-in from other sites to think this is something that they should do or want to do or need to do. And then on the institutional side, I, I think it would be to get hospitals to invest in the kinds of innovations that we're demonstrating actually work when you don't have several million dollars from CMS to jumpstart the whole process. And you know, we, we knew right from the start that our challenge on the cost side was obviously we had to save CMS money because that was what we alleged we would do when we wrote for the grant. Uh, but we also have to save the hospital money and, and those are often two different things. Things that save CMS money may be invisible to the hospital and vice versa. So we're, we're collecting the data to make the case to both of those audiences as to how the things we're doing, which are obviously improving care for patients, and the quality stuff is easy to demonstrate, but we'll save both CMS money and we'll save the hospital money. For example, CMS doesn't really care about hospital length of stay because they pay based on a DRG. But for the hospital, if our innovations get the patient out more quickly, then their revenue stream is positively impacted by having more discharges per year per bed. So we have to work on both fronts. And occasionally, uh, some of the limitations to our innovation really have come from regulatory uh, sources. One of the things our um, uh, transitional care team has been able to do, and, and for people in the industry, you know sort of how extraordinary this is, we're now getting patients directly from the emergency department into subacute uh, rehab beds. 
without going through an acute care hospitalization. And we've even gotten a couple into long-term care facility placement <coughs> out of the emergency department. And that's by putting all the resources that we need to do that into the emergency department. An important piece of that is physical therapy, because they can't go to some acute rehab without a physical therapy evaluation. We now, as part of Jedi Wives, can get physical therapy consults in the emergency department. Mm -hmm. and, and we actually do that for a number of issues. But they have to have a qualifying three day stay. We probably could be doing this on a daily basis, but for the qualifying three day stay rule. Um, another regulatory issue has been on our health information exchange because of some decisions made by uh, New York State and the way they set it up. We actually have to get consent from patients to participate in the health information exchange. So we can only get event notifications on those patients who have opted in. Uh, now there are some states who set up their health information exchange as an opt out. So, so there are lots of things that would make it even easier to do more innovative things, but you know, we keep bumping up against the portions of the system that aren't really embracing uh, innovation. But we think we'll get there. And we think ultimately every emergency department is going to have to figure out how to take care of older adults. Uh, and so we, we have a toolkit that we'll be rolling out for them to help them do that. Fermi, do we have time for maybe two questions? Uh, yes, as long as they're not short speeches disguised as questions. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin, the primary care physician. My question is for Mary. When we, I was intrigued by your story about AML um, way back when, when you found that it was taking so long for uh, good treatments to get out to the physicians, did you look into why and did you think of trying to speed that along? Well, I, I don't remember the discovery to dissemination of information at point of care stat at that time. I just know now it's seven to 17 years. In terms of why, um, it's coupled with how much information is out there. I mean, if you go back to 1900s, there was a Merck manual. In 1920s, there were four primary journals. We now have 8,000 journals, each one of them filled with um, raw science. So y y the math just uh, doesn't support. That's why when the doubling of information, I mean, we now double the amount of information that someone's supposed to know in medicine in less than five years. So it's really just pure math. Couple that with, in the 1900s, it was primarily a home-based um, physician care system. The doctor would go, trade off a couple chickens, whatever, whatever, execute care. On an average, it was estimated at 90 minutes. The amount of knowledge they have was in their back pocket in a Mer Merck manual. Now, you know, the, cro the cross, because um, now it's three to four minutes, 24, 32 patients a day, you know, four minutes face-to-face -face patient time. The cross was around 1950s, uh, the shift to uh, office-based physician practice, and the amount of information was out there, you could disseminate it in about 22 minutes, and guess what, that's how long the practice was. So in the 1950s was the last time we saw a blend between the amount of knowledge being disseminated and the amount of time a patient had to disseminate knowledge to their, pa to their patient. So the line went you know, like that and like that. And you know, the definition of error um, is that you know something and do something else. Well, if you've got doubling of information going in every five years, there's no chance that a physician can stay current. Um, you can read the journals, and right now, an average physician will read one medical article out of their primary journal. You know, whether it's Lancet, New England, or whatnot, if they're a hematologist, maybe, you know, blood or something of that sort. So the, to answer your question, it, it's just pure math that you can't um, get all that information. So the grids and the, and the trends were so clear when we plotted this all out that we said, oh boy. You know, and the doubling is going to, it's going to go down to a doubling of information of less than a year. <coughs> and so it, it, the question wasn't, um, you know, how will a physician ever catch up at the point of care? It, we know that cow is now long out of the barn. So we said, all right, what we have to do is build a system that can take, of, here's the knowledge and here's the amount of time. We need to filter this down to the point of care in the, at just-in-time sort of technology. 
Medicine actually does remarkably well when you compare it to other industries. Uh, when we went to Champaign-Urbana, they had this kind of an analysis done with cars, with banking, with everything. Medicine, when someone shows up in the emergency room, you don't have a team of people who are saying, let me design the next you know, formula for two years. It's boom. So you're essentially assembling a assembly line on real time. So, you know, healthcare does remarkably well considering the knowledge changes, the constraints, the investments in capital product. I mean, you can't, if you, you have to use what you've got there. I mean, so it does really, really well, but that, it's just math to answer your question. And information has to just be part of the formula on how to narrow some of these gaps so we're not practicing, you know, really old knowledge. Would you like that to be the last word? Or one more? One more question. One more question. Okay. Oh, so there. <laughs> to you, friend Marie. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Andy, and thank you, uh, panelists. And I'd like everybody to join me in not only <coughs> thanking this panel, but also our authors who are in the <laughs> panel. And the authors that were not able to be in the room as well because it was a, a, a true work of, of the heart on all of their parts. And I want to thank my audience because if you host a party and no one shows, it's not a party. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Last thing is um, no one ever puts on something like this alone. There's a small army of people who made the magic behind the scenes. And I'd like to say thank you, Katie Payne. Thank you so much, uh, David Baird. Thank you so much, Katia and uh, Debbie, uh, for all of that you've done uh, to make this a tremendous success. And uh, with that, we conclude. Thank you.